Lethal Kiss. By Ash Enifi. EXT Jaguar Convertible, Moving, Day. We see a 1956 Jaguar XK140 Convertible Classic moving on the coastline of Pacific Ocean. Int. Jaguar Convertible, Moving, Day. Ethan, 32, is behind the wheel. He's a good-looking man, the kind of paramour that girls fall in love with at sight. We notice there is a red rose in the passenger seat. EXT Stars Bar, Day. An established shot of Stars Bar. It's a five-star bar located in the middle of nowhere. Ethan comes driving and parks his car at the parking lot. He gets out of the car and walks toward the bar. Int. Stars Bar, Day. A young attractive girl Amanda, 22, is at the bar cleaning glasses. At the entrance, Ethan walks in. Amanda looks at him. Ethan approaches her. Ethan, hi. Amanda, hi. Ethan, may I speak to Christina? Amanda, she doesn't work here anymore. Ethan, do you know by any chance where I can find her? Amanda, she moved to London. Are you her boyfriend? Ethan, we are good friends. Amanda, she left six months ago. I don't think she's planning to return. Her father sold the bar to a new owner. Ethan, I see. A beat. You don't serve breakfast here, do you? Amanda, no. It's closed. We don't open till 12 p.m. I just left the door open, so fresh air can circulate around. But if you're hungry, I can make you scrambled eggs. Ethan, that would be a kind of you. Amanda, I'll be right back. Amanda walks to the kitchen. Ethan looks around the bar. We see photographs of movie stars, from silent and classic films era, idols, icons, to golden age movie stars, from legends in 50s, 60s, 70s. To modern days actors and actress, Al Pacino in Scarface, Marilyn Monroe, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca, Charlie's Chaplin in City Light. Bette Davis, Grace Kelly, Catherine Hepburn, Sophia Loren. Angelina Jolie in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Robert De Niro, Audrey. Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's, Leonardo DiCaprio, Julia. Robert in Pretty Woman, Brad Pitt in Fight Club, Vivian Lee. In Gone with the Wind, Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity. Morgan Freeman, Marlon Brando in Streetcar Named Desire. Elizabeth Taylor in A Place in the Sun, James Dean in Rebel. Without a Cause, Antonio Banderas and Salma Hayek in Desperado, Robert Downey Jr., Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills. Cop, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Denzel Washington, Haley Berry. Johnny Depp, Penelope Cruz, Will Smith, Meryl Streep, Tom Cruise, Demi Moore, Clark Gable, Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta in Pulp Fiction, Lupita Nyong'o, Cameron Diaz, Kate Winslet, Jodie Foster, Michelle Pfeiffer, etc. The camera focuses on Barbara Stanwyck. Ethan looks at her. He senses she is looking at him, turns his eyes, walks to the nearest table, pulls a chair, sits, and waits for Amanda. Int. Stars Bar, minutes later. Amanda returns to the bar with Ethan's scrambled eggs and places the food at Ethan's table. Ethan, that was quick. Amanda, do you want anything to drink? I can get you beer. It's in the house. Ethan, I don't usually drink beer during daytime, might give me headache. Instead let me have coke. Amanda walks to the bar, grabs a can of coke from a refrigerator, opens it, and places cubes of ices in a glass. She pours the soda in the glass, and returns to Ethan's table with the coke. Amanda places the drink on the table and sits in front of Ethan who has already begun to eat. Amanda, you like it, the eggs. Ethan, it's sweet. Amanda, I put honey on it. Ethan, what else did you put? Amanda, I put a little bit salt and rosemary powder. Ethan, it's delicious, the best scrambled eggs I've ever had. Ethan takes scrambled eggs with his spoon and feeds her. Amanda eats it. Ethan takes a sip from his soda. There is a silent moment. Ethan notices Amanda is looking at him with sexual desire. She then. Amanda, I'm Amanda. You never told me your name. Ethan, I'm sorry. I'm Ethan. He offers her right hand to shake. Amanda takes it. Amanda, pleased to meet you. Ethan, the pleasure is mine. Amanda, do you have a girlfriend? Ethan, why did you ask? Amanda, I'm curious. You're a very attractive man. Ethan, thanks for the compliment. But no I don't have a girlfriend. There is a silent moment. Ethan takes a sip from his soda and puts down the glass. Amanda can't take her eyes off him. She continues to look at him sexually. She then. Amanda, do you want to have sex? Out of nowhere she produces her underwear and places it on the table. Ethan looks at her eyes. He doesn't want to disappoint her. After all she made him one of the best scrambled eggs in the world. The only way to thank this kind alluring girl is by making sweet love to her. Amanda is a perfect 10. He would like to build a temple in his heart and worship her eyes if he must run into her in his thoughts, desires, and emotions. Ethan begins to loosen his belt. Amanda, wait. Let me close the door. Amanda gets up, walks up to the door, closes it, and begins to strip her clothes one by one as she approaches Ethan. Amanda stands nude in front of Ethan. Ethan sucks her nipples, gets up, removes his shoes, removes his pants completely. He is not wearing underwear. Amanda and Ethan kiss salaciously. 
He then turns her around, bends her against a table, and begins to fuck her doggy style. Amanda makes all kinds of sexual sounds. She is loving it. Ethan pulls her hair. Amanda turns around. They kiss more lasciviously. Ethan places her on the table, gets between her legs, grabs her buttocks, and enters her as they continue to have sex. We see some of the photographs of the movie stars in between the sex as if they were watching Ethan. Ethan looks at Barbara who continues to look at him with seduction as if she had known him her whole life. We stay with Ethan and Amanda for a bit as they continue to have pornography style sex. Int. Ethan's Jaguar convertible, moving, day. Close, up, Ethan. Ethan is driving. He takes out a cigarette, lights it, and smokes. Ethan turns his eyes and looks at the red rose in the passenger seat. EXT Ethan's Jaguar convertible, moving, day. An established shot of Ethan's 1956 Jaguar XK140 convertible as Ethan continues to drive in the coastline of California. We see the Pacific Ocean in the left-hand side. He is driving north. EXT Lou Garage, day. A man named Tommy Valentine, 32, is working on 1982 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray. We see all kinds of European and American classic cars. 1960s Ford Mustang, 1960s Pontiac GTO, 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California, 1954 Mercedes-Benz 300SL, 1969 Dodge Charger, 1960s Chevy Camaro, 1965 Jaguar E-Type, 1967 Ferrari 275 GTB-4, 1971 Lamborghini Miura SV, 1960s Ford Thunderbird, 1960s Lincoln Continental, etc. There are three more mechanics, Sean, Tony, and Jimmy, fixing cars. Ethan comes driving, parks his car at the garage, and gets out of the car. Tommy sees him. He stops what he's doing and walks up to him as Ethan approaches him. Tommy, what's up? Ethan, what's up? They hug and shake hands greeting with style as if they had known each other for a long time. Tommy, I thought you were dead. Ethan, I'm still alive. Tommy, I heard you were in coma. You crashed your flying car inside a living room. Ethan, I couldn't help but cheat death. Tommy, you are alive that all it matters. Jesus loves you. He wants you around for some reason. Your time is not up. Ethan, maybe. Tommy, what brought you here? Ethan, I came to get my hand dirty. Do you have anything for me? Tommy, we're always looking for a sorcerer that knows everything about cars, including flying. Come on. You can give me hand on that 1982 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray. I just bought it two days ago for 20,000 grand. Ethan and Tommy come to the car. Tommy, something is wrong with the transmission. I might have to get new gear and sell it for $52,000 twice the money I bought it. Which is assuming I'd find new gear for six grand in black market. It's classic. They only made 50 of them. Ethan, what about the engine, does it work? Tommy, the engine is good. It's just the gear. It makes a lot of noise. Ethan and Tommy begin to look at it. Tommy, working on the car how was LA? I heard you got your dick caught in a pussy trap prior to the accident. Ethan says nothing. Tommy reads Ethan's thought. Tommy, I'm sorry. I don't mean it like that. It's just. You know, if the devil wants to destroy your life, there is nothing you can do about it but to pray. Louis Valentine, 52, aka Uncle Lou comes to Ethan, who is helping Tommy. Ethan sees him. Lou, Ethan. Cassless, Uncle Lou. Ethan approaches him to greet him. They embrace greeting. They must know each other very well. Lou, what's up? Ethan, nothing much. Lou, I thought you were dead, flying car and all. How are you? Ethan, I'm fine. Lou, when did you get here, this beautiful town? Ethan, earlier. Today. There is a silent moment. Lou looks at him, as if he reads his mind. Lou, you don't mind getting your hand dirty, do you? Ethan, not at all. Lou, you haven't forgotten how to fix cars, have you? Ethan shakes his head no. Ethan, no I haven't. Lou, we'll get you start $16 per hour. They begin to walk toward Lou's office. Lou, do you have a place to stay? Ethan. I'm planning to stay at a motel for a couple of days till I find my own place. They stand near the office. Lou, you can stay at the guest house till you find your own place, free of charge. Mikasa Sukasa. Ethan smiles appreciatively. They enter the office. Int. Lou's house, guest house, day. Ethan sits at a table, looking at sensual paintings from an art history book while taking notes. There is a knock at the door. Ethan stops what he is doing, gets up and opens the door. We see a young beautiful girl Lolita Valentine, 24, standing at the door with sandwich. Lolita, what's up? Ethan, nothing much. Lolita, I made you turkey sandwich. Can I come in? Ethan lets her in. She gives him the sandwich. Ethan takes the sandwich. Lolita closes the door as Ethan puts the sandwich on the table. Lolita, I thought you were dead. Ethan, humorously why everybody thought I was dead? Lolita, because you never called us. You never told us your whereabouts, you just disappeared for 10 years. You then got in a flying car accident. Before that, there was news about rape charge. 
You assaulted a girl like wild things with Matt Dillon and Dennis Richards. Ethan says nothing. Lolita, don't worry. I know you're innocent. It's not your fault. Ethan, maybe it's my fault. I shouldn't have put myself in that position. Life is like a baseball. You know, sometimes, it gives you happiness. As soon as you figure it out, it throws you a curveball. We just have to stay in the game. Perhaps take the good with the bad and learn from our mistakes. Lolita, I'll tell you a secret. It's sex thing. We love it. And when guys get too cautious, we turn against them. It's a little bit complicated. Ethan, under his breath you could say that. Lolita, anyway, I started modeling, I mean, been doing it for three years. I have traveled around the world, London, Rio de Janeiro, Rome, New York, Milan, lived in Tokyo for four months. I was on the cover of French, Japanese, Italian, and Russian Vogue. I appeared on the cover of Elle, Marie Claire, and various international magazines. I did a couple of runways for famous brands. As good as life is, I missed home. I am going to take time from modeling, maybe hang around here for a while. Or go to Amsterdam, you know, focus on photography. It's my passion. I like taking pictures of people. Perhaps someday, I will travel around the world, take photos of interesting individuals, and do a photo gallery. He says nothing. There is a silent moment. They look at each other. She then. Lolita, I'm not here to have sex with you, even though you are the best thing ever happened to me. I used to touch myself while thinking about you. I still do it occasionally. She begins to make advance on him. Ethan is a little bit uncomfortable. Ethan, you're like my sister. There is nothing between us. Lolita, now all of a sudden, we're like brother and sister. We're not even related. Your uncle married my mother. I doubt if he's your real uncle. But that's a different story. I am in love with you. I want to know how your penis feels like inside my vagina. Ethan, don't talk like that, Lolita. He's still your father. He trusted me. Lolita, why did you kiss me? Ethan, what are you talking about? I never kissed you. You came to my room without a single drop of cloth and decided to sleep with me. You said you just wanted to talk to me for five minutes. You then kissed me. Lolita, you could have taken my virginity. Ethan, for Christ's sake, you were 13. Lolita, no I was 14 and a half. I saw my period. I was a woman. You were 22. You just chickened out. Ethan, it's better to be a chicken, and wish someday you could fly like an eagle, and go to a place where they give out hearts, than be a peacock, fuck every girl, who looks like angels, and get yourself in trouble. Lolita, you have always ways with words. But the fact is I was madly in love with you. Ethan, that was the main reason I had to disappear from this town, a girl, whom I see as my sister, telling me she was in love with me. I would have killed guys just for looking at you. Lolita, would you have killed them because you see me as your sister? Or you would have murdered them, because you were in love with me? You were just waiting for me to turn 16. And then fuck me like a rabbit. Tell me the truth. I saw you looking at my vagina that night, while we were listening to Justify My Love. It was past 2 a.m., my first house party. You were supposed to keep an eye on me. Later, everybody left home. We were alone. I was wearing your favorite miniskirt, played Madonna's Justify My Love, removed my underwear, danced exotic for you while pretending to be drunk. I then lied on the floor and opened my legs temptingly, hoping you would get between my legs and make love to me. But you acted you were not interested, or maybe you thought I was drunk. However, I was faking it. Got up, sat next to you, and rest my cheek on your penis. You had a big heart on. You grabbed the couch pillow, lifted my head tenderly, placed it on your lap, and allowed me to rest my cheek on the cushion, and caressed my hair. I thought it was one of the sweetest things anyone has ever done for me and didn't bother to seduce you, just pretended to fall asleep. But I know you have always wanted to fuck me. Let's face it. You wanted me so bad. She removes her underwear, approaches him seductively. Lolita, I like you, Ethan. Not a single day goes by that I didn't think of you. She touches his private part. Ethan allows her. Lolita, I know I am beautiful. I see how guys look at me. She kisses him. Ethan allows her. Lolita, I would have never made a move on you. But a lot of guys tell me I'm the sexiest girl they've ever fucked. She gives him a hickey on his neck. Ethan allows her. Lolita, you know how we girls are. We love sex more than guys do. However, we love pleasing men sexually as much as receiving pleasure, especially blowjob. It's a fair game. She opens his belt. Ethan allows her. She drops his pants and begins to give him a blowjob. Ethan pulls her hair, getting her up. They kiss sexually. Then Ethan completely removes his pant. He turns her around, bends her against the table, and fucks her behind. Ethan then pulls her hair and kisses her lips. They come to the bed. Lolita lies on the bed and opens her legs seductively. Ethan gets between her legs and enters her. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Lou Garage, Day. Ethan is working on a 1966 Shelby Cobra 427S-C. He then stops what he's doing and goes to a soda machine. Ethan places a dollar in the machine and gets a can of Coke. 
He opens the can and takes a sip as he walks toward the exit. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan stands outside and takes a soda break. Then an extremely attractive girl Nicole Fox comes driving 1953 Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at Lou Garage. She is 22. The sexiest thing we have ever seen in our lives. We can sense trouble from the get-go. Her lips, her eyes, her body. She smells like sex, tastes like sex, feels like sex. Everything about her, from her head to her toe is to die for. Ethan looks at her. He's speechless as if his soul jumped out of his body and disappeared from the face of the earth in excitement. We can see it in his eyes he will kill for this young arresting woman. Ethan puts his soda aside and walks up to her. Nicole looks at him as he approaches her. We can sense it. She is into him as well. Nicole's car is smoking, like her soul. Nicole, hi, my car is smoking. I don't know what's wrong with it. Ethan, can you pop up the hood? Nicole gets in her car and pops up the hood. Ethan opens the hood and looks at it. Nicole exits her car and stands next to him. Ethan pulls out the dipstick from the engine and checks it. There is not a single drop of motor oil. Ethan, when is the last time you put motor oil? Nicole, what's motor oil? I just drive. Was I supposed to put anything? Ethan, you should put oil when it reads low on the dipstick, every 3,000 miles. It's a 1953 Chevy Corvette Classic. Nicole, I didn't know that. Thank for telling me. But should I be concerned for any damage? Ethan, no it's nothing. I'll be right back. Ethan goes to the garage. We stay with Nicole. She takes out a lipstick from her purse and applies it on her lips. Nicole puts her lipstick back in her purse, takes out a small mirror, and looks at her image. She looks gorgeous. She knows she can make any man do anything for her. It's not an opinion. It's a fact beyond reasonable doubt. Ethan returns from the garage carrying two motor oils in a plastic bag. Nicole puts her mirror back in her purse and looks at him with seduction. Ethan acts professional. He takes out a motor oil from the plastic bag. He puts the bag that has motor oil 2 on the floor and places motor oil 1 in the engine. Ethan gets behind the wheel and starts the car to check the engine. It works fine. There is no smoke. Ethan gets out of the car, closes the hood, puts the first motor oil back in the plastic bag and gives it to her. Ethan, here. You can keep them. Just make sure you put oil whenever it reads low on the red dipstick sign. Nicole, how much do I owe you? Ethan, it's on me. Don't worry about it. Nicole, that's not fair. You gave me two motor oils. I took your time. Seductively, I have to pay you something. He knows what she means. But he plays it cool. Ethan, a kiss on the cheek is worth more than a million dollars. She gets closes and kisses him on the side of lips without hesitation. Ethan, that wasn't cheek. You kissed me on the lips. Nicole, it's okay. You can keep the change. Ethan, are you sure about that? You know, I am willing to provide you free service. Nicole, you're handsome. Ethan, playing along you think so. They get closer lips to lips as if they wanted to kiss. Nicole, you have beautiful eyes. Ethan, that's what girls keep telling me. I then end up making love to them. Later, they wouldn't let me go. Nicole, playing along why is that? Ethan, humorously they can't get enough of me. Nicole, why should they get enough of you? You are charming. Ethan, if I am charming, you're a remarkably attractive girl. I have never seen a teardrop as beautiful as you. Nicole, thanks for the compliment. But it's too bad. I'm married. As tempting as you are, I can't involve in an extra marriage affair. Though, I might need free inspection, between my legs occasionally if not often. Can I count on you? Ethan, I have life. I'm not Casanova. Nicole, I never met Casanova. Ethan, he was a famous womanizer. Nicole, are you a womanizer? Ethan, softly by her lips no. I'm not. I believe true love is something that's conceived at the depth of a man's heart at the sight of his soulmate, and to feel her with every gram of his essence, and to adore her as if nothing had ever existed in the universe, but her sparkling eyes, delicious lips, beautiful face, her sense of present from her head to her toe. I can keep on going, till love reveals the mystery of your supernatural beauty in my quintessence. You are like spell that preys on heart, but pretends she lives outside, so she can get a good look at the suspect, or rather the victim, and then consumes his soul without mercy. Nicole, I like to think he is a suspect. Ethan, you have already chewed a chunk of my heart out. I am as good as a victim. Nicole, is that right? Ethan, if you look at the definition of victim in the dictionary, it would say a man, who lost his heart to a beautiful woman by means of spell, or suffer great deal of wound, just looking at her eyes, or his cardiac muscle torn apart with the thought of kissing her mouth-watering lips. Nicole, you're romantic. Ethan, I'm not that romantic. You're the sexiest woman I've ever seen in my life. Nicole, thanks. But there is nothing I can't do about it. They gaze at each other intimately. Their lips are almost touching. Yet Nicole plays it cool. Nicole, I should be going. I have to be home. She gives him soft kiss on the lips, turns around, gets in her 1953 Chevy Corvette convertible, and starts the engine. Nicole, bye. Ethan, take care. Ethan looks at Nicole with longing as she drives away. EXT Blue's house, night.
Ethan sits at a table with a glass of whiskey. On the stage, a girl named Scarlett sings jazz. Ethan watches her. Then Scarlett finishes singing. The audiences clap to show their appreciation. Scarlett walks up to Ethan and sits at his table. Scarlett, what's up, Ethan? Ethan, nothing much. Scarlett, how's life treating you? Ethan, like a criminal. Scarlett, I always thought you were a criminal. Even in LA, when we used to hang out together, you gave me goosebumps. Ethan, playing along I don't believe you. Scarlett, seductively whenever I look at your eyes, they give me pain in my heart. Ethan, playing along that's the thing about pain. It's unpredictable. I don't have to look at your eyes to find you the bottom of my heart. I can just close my eyes. Closes his eyes, and see you dancing with my soul. Opens his eyes. Your vision. Scarlett, thanks for the compliment. But tell me what is so painful about me dancing with you soul. Ethan, humorously I sprained my ankle. She smiles softly. Scarlett, I thought I meant something to you. Ethan, you mean everything to me. I just didn't want you to know that I am insane, and how you bite my aorta in vain, and leave me with excruciating pain. You are kissable. I could spend the rest of my life falling in love with you at sight, as if I were looking at you for the first time in twilight, kissing your eyebrow, cheeks, nose and lips without fight and flight, as if I were making classic film noir in color instead of black and white, and making love to you in limelight if not day and night. Scarlet, that is poetic. But what do you mean by in vain? Ethan, you tell me. Scarlet, what do you want to hear? Ethan, there is something about you that I can't get enough of. Scarlet, what is it? Ethan, I know what it is. But I would rather hear it from you. Scarlet, I am not very good at talking about myself. Why don't you just tell me? Ethan, it is your lips. Scarlet, what about them? Ethan, they are the breath of life and fountain of passion. If I die, just come and give me a soft kiss on the lips as if love didn't know anything that lies beneath. I would return from death, and kiss your lips till I run out of breath, and, and caress your body as if I were celebrating a day that acknowledges your sensuality, grace, achievement, and birth, and make love to you as if I had sworn to bring you the greatest joy, sweet orgasms, and beautiful love in sickness and mirth. And kiss your luscious lips more deliciously with every beat of my heart for everything fever is worth, and continue to make love to you till you become immortal as if you were beaten by a vampire that walks on earth, or rather a butterfly that loved to run in your thoughts, feelings, and desires, and light your soul as resplendent as twilight on a bay, creek, and firth, yet passion, which makes its presence felt in your belly disguised as craving so much the sweetest to seek a precious dahlia. That drops in your tammy, an alluring pain, hidden treasure of kisses, forbidden romance, and enchanting and tender heartbeats that love can't wait to unearth, and take you in erotic voyager, and leave you in the air as love didn't know anything about bed, hammock, mattress, and birth. Scarlet, what do you mean by leave me in the air? Ethan, out of body experience. You would have the best orgasm of your life, your soul will jump out of your body and float in the air. Scarlet, you know how to seduce a girl, don't you? Ethan, seduction is nothing but a theory, which states that sex is more important than religion. Some scholars think it's the physical expression of love. We should engage in sexual activity as often as possible, and spread the message of love across the world. Scarlet, speak for yourself. I'm 29 years old woman. I'll be 30 in September. I'm not looking for a friend with benefit. Ethan, what are you looking for? Scarlet, a man who can make me breakfast in the morning. A man who treats me like a princess in the daytime. A man who can take me out to a romantic restaurant in the evening, and tells me I am beautiful. A man who can make love to me till I melt to the last molecule. He then holds me close to his heart all night. Ethan says nothing. They gaze at each other. She then. Scarlet, is that too much to ask? Ethan, not at all. There is a silent moment. She then. Scarlet, never mind breakfast. I can live without breakfast, I would just drink coffee and eat lunch at noon. You've always treated me like a princess as long as I know you. I don't really care about a romantic restaurant. We can always have Chinese carry out, or I would cook for you, spaghetti and macaroni. I know I'm beautiful. You don't have to tell me if you have a dime for every time you saw a girl as gorgeous as me, you would have 10 cents, or ask me if it hurt when I fell from heaven. I just need a man who can make love to me till I'm burned to the cervix bone. Check your pocket. Ethan checks his pocket and finds Scarlett's underwear. He doesn't know how it got in his pocket. She slides over, collects her dress, and shows him her vagina to let him know it's her underwear. Ethan is still puzzled by everything. Scarlett, I saw you walking in. I told Amy to put it in your pocket without your knowledge. I've seen her do it to cute guys. She's pro. Ethan, it's not the underwear. I'm troubled by what you just said about a man who can make love to you till you're burned to the cervix bone. Is that possible? Scarlett, why don't you surprise me? Ethan, I'll give it a shot. Hint. Ethan's apartment, studio, night. Ethan and Scarlett make love on a mattress that is placed on the floor. Ethan is between Scarlett's legs fucking the living hell out of her. They both are sweating like butter on fire. Ethan lifts Scarlett's left leg and continues to enter her with amazing speed. We stay with them for a bit. Hint. Ethan's apartment, studio, later. Ethan and Scarlett sleep. Ethan is awake. He is smoking a cigarette. Scarlett, 
who is sleeping on Ethan's chest, seems she might never wake up. Then Nicole, who is wearing Ethan's shirt and Victoria's secret underwear, comes from the kitchen and sits in a sofa. She takes out a cigarette from her chest pocket, lights it and smokes. Nicole, I knew you were a womanizer. Ethan smiles in wonder. Nicole takes a drag and exhales out the smoke. Nicole, I wish someday you would make love to me like how you fucked her, and hold me next to your heart like that. Ethan says nothing. He just continues to smoke. Nicole, I have an idea. Nicole kills the cigarette, gets up, and walks up to Ethan. She removes her underwear and gets in his blanket. Nicole, you don't trust me, do you? He says nothing. Nicole begins to give him hand job. Ethan kills his cigarette and allows her to do whatever she pleases. Nicole, do you love me? Ethan, very much. Nicole continues to give him hand job. She then goes down and begins to give him oral sex. Ethan closes his eyes. He is feeling it. Ethan opens his eyes. It's a dream. Nicole is not there. Scarlett is giving him a blowjob. She then stops. Scarlett, I think you're ready. She kisses his lips, gets on the top of him, and rides him sensually. Ethan lets her have him. He closes his eyes and smiles with pleasure. Scarlett continues to ride him. Then Scarlett turns into Nicole. Ethan looks at her in puzzlement. It feels good. Yet, he opens his eyes and finds Scarlett, gets her in the bottom, kisses her lips sweetly, and enters her deliciously. We stay with them for a bit. EXT 4th of July Parade, Day. A small parade is in progress. People stand both sides of the street and watch the celebration. Ethan and Scarlett watch the festival. They are holding hands. Ethan sees Nicole in the other end of the street. She is with her friend Olivia, 23. Nicole turns her eyes and sees Ethan. She gives him a beautiful smile. In the meantime, she notices he's with someone. She's not jealous or anything, but turns her eyes and focuses on the parade. Ethan continues to look at her. Nicole catches his eyes a couple of times. She then excuses Olivia and goes to an ice cream stand nearby. Ethan tells Scarlett something. They kiss on the lips goodbye. Ethan cuts through the parade, gets the other end of the street, and approaches Nicole who has already bought ice cream. Ethan, hi. Nicole, hi. Ethan, are you having fun? Nicole, kind of. It's an excuse to get out of the house. There is a silent moment. Nicole licks her ice cream seductively. They gaze at each other. He then. Ethan, you look good. Nicole, thanks. There is a silent moment. Nicole licks her ice cream more. She then. Nicole, who's that girl that you were with? Ethan, she's a friend. I've known her for a while. Nicole, I see. Ethan, what, are you jealous? Nicole, no. I'm not jealous. She's pretty. Ethan, you're the prettiest girl in state of California if not in the solar system. Nicole, you're just saying that to make it up to me. Ethan, if I wanted to make it up to you, I would have asked you out a date and kiss you till my lungs explode inside my body. Nicole, so, what's stopping you from asking me out? Ethan, would you go out with me? Nicole, no I can't. My husband will kill me if he sees me with a beautiful stranger. Ethan, I understand. Nicole, I should be going. He is coming any minute to pick us up. She kisses him on the lips, with a little bit tongue. Nicole, bye. Nicole goes toward her friend. On the soundtrack, music plays melodiously. Ethan stands and looks at her. The parade has already passed. People are moving in the street. Then. Cadillac convertible. Nicole's husband John Fox, 42, comes driving 1959 Cadillac Eldorado Beeritz convertible through the crowd and pulls next to Nicole and Olivia. Nicole throws her ice cream in the trash, opens the door, lets Olivia get in the back first, and enters in the passenger seat. John and Nicole exchange soft kisses. John greets Olivia. Nicole and John have few words. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. John starts the car and drives away as Ethan stands in the sidewalk and watches. Nicole gives him a wink as the car passes by him. Ethan gets in the main street and walks down in the middle of lanes. We take it with overhead shot. Int. Tiffany bar and restaurant, night. Tommy, Amber, Tommy's girlfriend, and Jimmy sit at a table, drinking wine and beers. Jimmy and Tommy are arguing about something. At the entrance, Ethan walks in. He comes and sits at their table. They must have expected him. They greet casually. Tommy, what's up? Ethan, what's up? Jimmy, hi. Ethan, hi. Ethan looks at Amber, so does she. Tommy, this is my girlfriend Amber. Amber, hi. Ethan, hi. They shake hands greeting. Ethan, nice to meet you. Amber, likewise. Tommy, she goes to the University of California at Siena. She's as smart as you. Ethan and Amber exchange looks. There is a spark between them. Tommy doesn't notice it. He places an extra beer in front of Ethan. Ethan, thanks. Jimmy, to Amber don't be fooled by his look. He has a PhD in art history. He taught art at UCLA. Tommy, to Ethan Jimmy and I were arguing about who is better. He said Leonardo da Vinci is better than Michelangelo. I said Michelangelo is more artistic than Leonardo. 
What do you think? Give us your expert opinion. Ethan, they were two of the greatest artists in the history of humankind. You could make argument for both. Leonardo da Vinci is widely considered to be one of the greatest painters of all time. He was also an inventor, an engineer, and a scientist. His works ranging from Mona Lisa, The Last Super, Lady with an Ermine and Virtue Man show the fundamental principle of flawless arts. He's genius. In the meantime, Michelangelo has a sense of rage, desire, and mania. He's passionate. He doesn't hold anything. He gives you fervent and nude art. He's like Adam in the Garden of Eden. However, unlike Adam, who spitted out the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Michelangelo swallowed the forbidden fruit of art, and he didn't feel any shame. He thought he was equal to God and expressed it through his arts. You look at David. A naked man standing as tall as God. It's his inner ego, something to be respected, feared, desired, and loved by humanity as much as the Creator itself. You look at Pieta. You might say that is the body of Jesus on the lap of his mother Mary. But the inner sexuality of young Michelangelo and subconscious behind the art tell a different story. It's Michelangelo himself in the lap of a girl, whom he once saw and fell in love with. He believed that a woman is life, despite the mysterious nature of his sexuality later in life. It shows his pain, passion, and immortality. He wanted us to know all men and women that would come after him would find themselves in his arts and inspire to be phenomena. Of course, you look at the Sistine Chapel, that's a giveaway. He was possessed by forces beyond this world. His mind, heart, sexuality, and soul cross invisible dimensions of good and evil and infuse with spiritual order and divine decree that are responsible for one's immortality and eternal salvation. Tommy, that's powerful stuff. Jimmy, that means Michelangelo is better than Leonardo. Amber, no. He didn't say that. He just doesn't have time to tell you the unselfconscious mind of Leonardo. But I have a different point of view. You might say Leonardo is genius. Michelangelo is God. But have you ever considered they might be overrated? I mean nowadays, there are software engineers who write software applications that allow you to gather information around the world as well as maps the entire universe. Scientists who make life from steam cell, and large hadron collider that collides particles close to the speed of light, looking for extra dimensions and Higgs boson so-called God particle, the building block of atoms. Leonardo drawing a Vitruvian man and designs for a flying machine in pieces of paper don't really make him genius. I think he should have focused on his paintings like Picasso did, instead of trying to be an engineer and a scientist with limited technology that they had back then. Maybe, we would have said he was the greatest painter ever lived. It's the same thing with Isaac Newton experimenting with alchemists fruitlessly. If Newton spent all his energy in physics, he had known how gravity works, general relativity and quantum theory before Albert Einstein, Lamarcus Adna Thompson, and Niels Bohr and so many things. But let's stick with art and talk about Michelangelo. What's his greatest work, the Sistine Chapel? To Ethan, how long did it take him to do it? Ethan, four years. Amber, are you telling me if I give a kid from Spanish Quarter, time here in Siena, he can't paint better than the drawings in the Sistine Chapel with better painting equipment and graphic designs we have nowadays. I have seen paintings that look like photographs. Time has changed. Anybody can carve a stone, create a magic with the technology we have in these days and age, and put them in front of a government buildings, landmarks, at the gardens and schools and universities. They can even make it look like a work of genius and place it at your multi-million dollar mansion if you pay them extra. It doesn't really require divine intervention to carve David, or Pieta from a rock. They oversell it as if they were cure for cancer. They all are impressed. She has left them speechless. Amber looks at Ethan and gives him a wink. Ethan says nothing, but can't believe what's this world coming to? Beautiful girls with brains. Jimmy, you convinced me. They're nothing but artists who had a lot of free time on their hands. Tommy, anyway. Guys, let's go back to the main argument that started it all, Jimmy said he won't fuck Venus of Urbino by Titian without some kinds of sexual emotion and intimate feeling. Jimmy, I said you just can't fuck anything that walk with two legs. I don't care how pretty the girl is. If I don't have emotional connection with her, I won't touch her. Sex is something that we're meant to enjoy with our hearts, you must give everything you have the depth of your soul to that special one, and don't hold anything back in order to achieve the highest pleasure known to creation. Tommy, I respect that. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever masturbated with your left hand? They all laugh. Amber is checking out Ethan as if she were looking at the beats of her heart in his eyes. Ethan catches her eyes. They exchange soft smiles. Tommy, you don't have to answer that. I know you are ambidextrous. It'll solve your emotional connection bullshit. Jimmy, in general, masturbation is different. It has nothing to do with sexual intercourse. Tommy, would you fuck Kate Upton? Jimmy, I'll fuck Kate Upton till her pussy goes sore. She's full of sexual emotion. Tommy, I know you would come to your sense soon or later. They all have small laugh. On the soundtrack, music plays. They continue to talk. But we don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. Amber continues to check out Ethan. He catches her eyes and gives her a soft smile. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Ethan's apartment, studio, night. Ethan is at his studio, painting, a nude picture of Nicole from his imagination. There is a knock at the door. Ethan stops what he's doing, goes to the door, and opens it, revealing Amber. 
She is wearing a seductive see-through dress that shows her skin. Amber, can I come here? Ethan hesitates for a second but lets her in. Amber looks at his paintings. Amber, I didn't know you paint. Ethan says nothing. Amber, I know what you're thinking, what she's doing here. She approaches him seductively. Amber, you were expecting me, weren't you? Ethan, what do you want? Amber, the same thing all girls want, to be adored, cherished, treasured, and love and be loved. A beat, I might have talked a little bit too much earlier. But I did it to get your attention. You were impressed, weren't you? Ethan, you're smarter than I thought. She gets closer to him. Amber, but seriously, do you find me attractive? Ethan, you're breathtaking. But you're my cousin's girlfriend. He loves you more than life itself. Amber, I love him too. But we are not serious. It's a matter of time before we go to our separate ways. I think you're the most gorgeous man I've ever met. I don't know what it is. But I just can't stop thinking about you. She kisses him. Ethan kisses her. Ethan, we shouldn't do this. Amber, we're not going to do anything that you don't want. She kisses him. They kiss intimately. He carries her and takes her to the bedroom. They remove each other cloths, kiss and fall on the bed. Ethan caresses her neck. Amber spreads her legs. Ethan gets between her legs and enters her as they begin to make love. Int. Ethan's apartment, studio, later. Amber is on top riding Ethan cowgirl style. She is making all kind of sexual sounds. We stay with them for a bit. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan is in the middle of fixing a 1992 Dodge Viper. On the soundtrack, music plays melodiously. It's Sunday. There is nobody in the garage. It is closed. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls her car at the garage. Ethan looks at her, stops what he is doing and comes up to her as she gets out of the car. Nicole, what's up? Ethan, nothing much. Nicole, I got a flat tire. Ethan, do you have a spare tire? Nicole, I think so. It's in the trunk. She pops up the trunk. Ethan and Nicole come to the trunk. Ethan opens the trunk, gets the spare tire, and puts it on the ground. Ethan goes to the garage and returns with Jack Hummer and a machine screwdriver. Ethan jacks the car up and begins to change the tire. Nicole stands and watches him. Nicole, so, what have you been doing? Ethan, nothing. Nicole, what's nothing? Ethan, just fixing cars. Nicole, joking so, what did you say nothing? Ethan, playing along I thought you said in term of doing something fun. You know, going out a date, walking in the park watching movies, things that most regular people do. Nicole, you haven't gone out a date since you got here? Ethan, no, I haven't. I stay at home and paint with my free time. Nicole, do you paint? Ethan, it's only a hobby. Nicole, I'd love to pose nude for you someday. Ethan smiles to himself and says nothing. He focuses on changing the tire. Ethan takes out the flat tire, puts the new tire, and fastens the plugs with the machine screwdriver. Ethan grabs the bad tire. Ethan, I'll check it. Nicole, don't bother. I'll buy a new tire. I just pierced it with a kitchen knife on purpose, so I could see you. Ethan, why is that? Nicole, I don't know. She approaches him seductively, and get closer to his lips. Nicole, I like you. You make me feel beautiful. I want to spend a quality time with you. Ethan, I'm busy. She is breathing at his lips. They are talking lips to lips. Nicole, it's okay. I am a girl who loves to get down dirty. She gives him a soft kiss on the lips. Nicole, I can help you. They kiss intimately. Ethan, what about your cloth, it will get dirty. Nicole, it's fine. I'll be in my underwear unless you have extra mechanic cloth that I can borrow. Ethan, I'll check. I don't want you to catch cold. Nicole, that's a thought of you. They kiss French. Int. Lou Garage, day. Ethan and Nicole work on a 1964 Aston Martin DB5. Ethan is shirtless. Nicole is wearing Ethan's work shirt and red Victoria Secret underwear. She looks sexy. Nicole, what's wrong with it? Ethan, oil viscosity. They put the wrong oil in the car. We just have to drain it out and put new motor oil. It's not that hard. Ethan and Nicole get under the car. Ethan gives Nicole the oil pan. She holds under the car to catch the oil. Ethan loosens the oil plug with a wrench and unscrews it with his hand. Oil drips on him as the oil drain into the pan. Ethan helps Nicole holding the pan as the oil flows out in a stream. Nicole looks at him sexually as if they could take bath with motor oil. Ethan reads her mind. He takes it from her hand and places it aside. Ethan replaces the oil plug, screws it with his hand and tightens it with the wrench. He wipes any excess oil off the car with a rag. They get out of under the car. Ethan, we're almost done. We just need to put new motor oil. Nicole places her hand in the motor oil, gets closer to Ethan, and rubs it on his chest. Ethan doesn't know if motor oil is harmless to human skin, and doesn't care. He likes the touch of Nicole's hand on his body. They get closer and kiss lasciviously. Nicole, referring to the motor oil is this thing hazardous? Ethan, I don't know. It might be. They kiss more intimately. Nicole parts her lips. Nicole, 
Where is everybody? They exchange soft kisses. Ethan, it's Sunday. The garage is closed. I'm working overtime. She removes Ethan's work shirt that she is wearing. She has nothing on. Her breasts hang on her chest beautifully. Nicole, make love to me. They kiss French. On the soundtrack, music plays. Ethan grabs her buttocks and picks her up. She wraps her legs around him. Ethan moves forward with her. He tips off the motor oil that they just change. Ethan brings her down on the floor and lies her on the motor oil. Ethan then removes his pant, comes next to her, nude. He takes the motor oil and paints on her breasts and belly. He removes her underwear, takes a motor oil, and applies it on her private part. Nicole likes his touch. Ethan massages her vagina with the motor oil. Not fingering her or stimulating her clitoris. Just deep massages, squeezing her vagina like a professional massager. He then kisses her lips. They kiss more passionately, gets between her legs, and enters her as they begin to make love in the motor oil. Int. Ethan's house, Ethan's studio, day. Ethan places red painting on Nicole who is lying nude on a canvas. Ethan is nude as well. He then comes down and kisses her. Nicole gets on top of Ethan and rides him cowgirl style. They are doing abstract body art while making love. Montage, making love and abstract body art. Ethan pours yellow ink on Nicole. Cut to, Ethan and Nicole make love in the yellow ink. Cut to, Ethan pours green ink. Ethan and Nicole make love in the green ink. Cut to, Ethan and Nicole make love in blue ink. Cut to, Ethan pours all kinds of inks on Nicole's body. Cut to, Ethan and Nicole make love in mixture of colors, etc. EXT Lou Garage, Day. Ethan is working on a 1967 Pontiac GTO convertible. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at the garage. Ethan stops what he's doing and walks up to her. Nicole remains in her car. Ethan and Nicole talk like two lovers. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. She then asks him to get in the car. Ethan walks around the car and gets in the passenger seat. Nicole starts the car. Ethan and Nicole get onto the street and drive away. EXT Resort and Restaurant, Pub, Lake, Day. It's a luxurious resort and restaurant located next to a breathtaking lake. Ethan and Nicole sit at a table having late lunch, turkey sandwich and pasta with glasses of red wines. They are not really eating. In fact, they have done eating. They are in the middle of conversing. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. We notice Nicole is playing with Ethan's private part with her foot. It's a little bit late for lunch. There is not a single person in the area. Nicole then removes her underwear, places it on her plate, gets up, walks around the table, and sits on Ethan's groin. They talk between soft kisses. Nicole tells him something seductive. Ethan looks around in case someone shows up. But he says, fuck it, opens his belt, grabs her buttocks, and enters her as they begin to make love in the pub. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Resort and restaurant, bedroom, day. Ethan and Nicole make love. It's passionate, seductive, and sensual. We stay with them with series cuts as they go at it with various sexual positions. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan is working on a 1970 Dodge Challenger R T. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at the garage. Ethan stops what he's doing and walks up to her. They talk without a sound. Nicole tells him to get in the car. Ethan tells her he will be right back and goes to Uncle Lou's office. We stay with Nicole. Nicole takes out a lipstick from her purse, applies it on her lips, puts her lipstick back in her purse, takes out a mirror, and looks at her lips. They look delicious. Nicole puts the mirror back in her purse and waits for Ethan. Ethan returns right back and gets in the passenger seat. They kiss. Nicole starts the car. Ethan and Nicole drive away. EXT Lake, day. Ethan and Nicole remove their clothes. They get completely nude, run down the shore, get into the lake, and swim down the water. Ethan stops in the middle. Nicole swims farther and turns around. Ethan swims toward Nicole. They get closer and talk between soft kisses. Ethan then carries her on his shoulder playfully. Nicole screams joyously. Ethan brings her down. Ethan and Nicole kiss in the middle of the sparkling lake. EXT Lake, later. Ethan and Nicole are having picnic. We see sushi, a bottle of wine and two glasses of red wine. They have barely touched their meals. As a matter of fact, they are done eating. Nicole lies on her back. Her head is resting on a pillow. She is nude. Ethan leans next to her. He is nude as well. They are talking between soft kisses. Ethan must have said something romantic. Nicole smiles in beauty, pushes him aside, and gets on top of him. Nicole, who is on top, and Ethan, who is lying on his back with his head resting on a pillow, talk between soft kisses. Nicole then rides Ethan alluringly as they begin to have sex. Ethan gets her on the bottom, kisses her lips, and enters her. We stay with them for a bit. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan is fixing a 1971 half Chevrolet Camaro. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at the garage. Ethan stops what he's doing and walks up to her. They talk without a sound. Nicole tells him to get in the car. The same thing. He tells her that he will be right back and goes to Lou's office. We stay with Nicole. Nicole takes out a lipstick from her purse, applies it on her lips, 
puts her lipstick back in her purse, takes out a mirror, and looks at her image. She looks beautiful. She puts the mirror back in her purse, and waits for Ethan. Ethan returns right back and gets in the passenger seat. They kiss French. Nicole starts the car in ease. Ethan and Nicole drive away. Hint. Movie theater, day. It's a private screening. Ethan and Nicole sit in the middle of the theater alone and watch Double Indemnity starring Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. Nicole gets up, sits on his lap, and tells him that she has a surprise for him. Three attractive girls come to the stage, carrying baskets that are filled with roses, and sprinkle the petals on the stage. Ethan doesn't know what's going on. Nicole tells him what she is up to. Ethan and Nicole talk between soft kisses and kiss intimately. Hint. Movie theater, later. Ethan and Nicole make love on a mattress that is placed on the stage for the sole purpose of the sex, surrounded by candles. On the big screen, we continue to see double indemnity. Ethan is between Nicole's legs kissing her lips and entering her sweetly. She scratches his back with her nails deep in sexual passion. It's steamy, seductive, and passionate. We stay with them with series cuts as they go at it with various sexual positions. EXT Lou Garage, Day. Ethan is fixing a 1975 Mercedes-Benz 450. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible, and pulls at the garage. Ethan stops what he's doing and walks up to her. They talk without a sound. She tells him to get in. He tells her that he will be right back and goes to Uncle Lou's office. We stay with Nicole. Nicole takes out a cigarette and a lighter from her purse, lights it, and begins to smoke as she waits for Ethan. Ethan returns right back and gets in the passenger seat. Nicole throws away the cigarette. They kiss. Nicole starts the car. Ethan and Nicole drive away. Hint. Ethan's apartment, studio, day. Nicole, lying on a bed in sensuality, poses nude for Ethan while smoking cigarette. Ethan does her portrait on a canvas. He is shirtless. We stay with them for a bit. Nicole then puts the cigarette aside and calls Ethan with her finger come on. Ethan puts his painting brush aside and approaches her. She asks him to strip his cloth. Ethan removes his pants and stands nude in front of her. Nicole gets up, kisses his chest, caresses his belly, and begins to give him blowjob. Nicole then returns to the bed, lies on her back, spreads her legs alluringly, and tells Ethan to give her oral pleasure. Ethan gets between her legs and begins to give her oral pleasure. Nicole is dying with sweet pleasure. She has a hypersensitive clitoris. She begins to moan like a porn star. Close, up, Nicole. Her face goes through all kinds of sexual passion phases, breathing heavy, in and out as if lungs were punctured with intense sexual pleasure. Nicole pulls Ethan here as she reaches orgasm. He gets closer to her lips. They kiss French. Nicole opens her legs wider as if she were telling him to fuck her. Ethan enters her and fucks her pornography style with amazing speed as if he had something to prove to her vagina. We hear the slapping sound as he enters her. They are going at it for real. We stay with them with series cuts as they continue to make love with various sexual positions. Hint. Ethan's apartment, Ethan's studio, day. Ethan and Nicole sit in the bathtub placed in the middle of the studio. Ethan is behind. Nicole rests on Ethan's chest. They are in the middle of conversation. Nicole, what did you teach? Ethan, art history. Nicole, what's art history? Ethan, art history is a lot of things. There is not one definition that sums it up. It deals with all forms of arts that human beings have done so far, from their meaning to the artists and the forces behind them. Nicole, what kind of forces? Ethan, never mind that I said forces. Just the artist behind them. I mean most artists are possessed by some kinds of supernatural forces, but you don't learn that at school. You have to experience it yourself, like one time I sat alone in my apartment here, and began to draw subconsciously, didn't know what I was drawing. But somehow, ended up drawing a person that looks like me burning in hell without a single drop of cloth while carrying this beautiful girl. She's nude as well, as if we were immune to the fire. Our lips are joined together in a passionate kiss. Nicole, that's sexy. Ethan, it felt like I was having out-of-body experience. I just didn't know what I was doing, you know, as if some kind of spirit were manifesting inside of me, the Prince of Darkness himself entered my soul and draw it without my knowledge. It's very seductive and sensual. In the meantime, it's scary like Judgment Day. But that's not the end of the story. The same night, I have this dream. I was walking on fire in hell and carrying the same girl from the painting while our lips locked in an intimate kiss. We were completely nude. She then parted her lips, and said, I will break your heart. You don't want to fall in love with a girl who is up to no good. I am rotten to the heart. I told her I couldn't breathe without her. We kissed passionately. Somehow, the girl looks exactly like you. Nicole, I like the idea of you carrying me and walking on fire in hell while we were kissing. It's erotic. But do you think I am rotten? Ethan, no. Something has to do with double indemnity, Phyllis Dietrich son played by Barbara Stanwyck, the same movie that we watched. She has been in my mind lately. Nicole, anyway, how did you get yourself in trouble in LA? Ethan, girls used to come up to me and ask me all kinds of questions in order to get my attention. I tried to ignore them. You know, I just said hi and bye, figuratively speaking, if it has to do with art, I would answer each question briefly, right to the point. However, 
most of the girls just wanted to flirt with me, show me nude portraits and ask me what the artists were thinking when they draw those paintings, if they had sex with the subject. Or do they keep it professional? I would just tell them some have engaged sexually with the subject. Some didn't. Yet, it is up to students to find out who involved sexually with the subject, write paper about the topic, and earn easy A, just to get them off my back. I would just hide. But this girl tracked me down and found me at this coffee shop where I hang out after I teach, sort of a hideout. She asked me if she could join me. I thought she was the prettiest girl in the school. I had seen her in the classroom looking at me that way. Nicole, what way? Ethan, you know, seductive. She always wears sexy clothes that show the majority of her skin, puts on ambrosial perfumes that turns any man on. Anyway, it was a matter of time. She might have been following me. I wouldn't know. She sat in front of me. We talked about art. She was smarter than I expected, knew everything there was to know about art. That kind of got my attention. She changed my mindset. She also read my PhD papers, and knew most of it by heart. Somehow, I was drawn into her intellectually, emotionally, physically, and sexually. The fact is I had always been attracted to her. However, I had to be professional. That's why I ignored her. But I won't lie to you. I had dreams of sleeping with her. Even fucking her in front of everybody in the classroom. She used to come to the class without wearing underwear and show me her vagina. You know, touching herself, and licking her finger. That day, we had sex on the hood of my car. From then on, we just couldn't stop. We fucked everywhere we could think of it. She even brought her friend. We had threesome. This happened while I was involved in a long relationship with my girlfriend Natalie, who lived in New York City. Then I had to end it. My girlfriend moved to Los Angeles. She asked me to marry her. We got engaged. The trouble just began. The girl wouldn't leave me alone. She threatened to tell Natalie everything. We carried the affair behind my girlfriend for a little while. Then I told her it's not fair for my fiancé. I asked her to put herself in her position. This had to end. She said nothing at first. She just acted innocent and left me alone. Then one day, after class, she asked me to make love to her for one last time, she would leave me alone forever. In the moment of passion, she removed my condom and asked me to fuck her like a beast. I just went for it, even got a little bit aggressive and bite her in excitement. Then next day, she said I raped her. I hired a very expensive lawyer. The case went to trial. I was about to spend 15 years in prison if the judge find me guilty. The police found my semen in her vagina. There were marks in her eyes. I didn't do it. But it didn't matter whether I hit or not. The juries believed her. They were photographs of my tooth marks on her breast as well as cuts on her body, which she must have done it to herself with a knife. I thought I was done. Luckily, at the last minutes, the same girl that we had threesome with, came to my defense, and testified against her friend. The prosecutors decided to drop the charge. But I lost my job. My girlfriend left me. Nobody wants to hire me, even elementary school refused to give me a second chance, to teach basic art classes. They wouldn't hire me with PhD. I did few ad jobs in LA, you know, my friend and I were designing the first car that fly in the air. Basically, it was my idea. I designed everything, but he supported me financially. We tasted it at Malibu Beach. All of a sudden, the flying car experienced technical difficulties in the air. I tried to land it safely, but the car flied out of control. The engine exploded. The car caught on fire and crashed in a rooftop of a villa, and went through the house. Luckily, no one is the house. I banged up my head bad. I suffer concussion despite the fact I was wearing a helmet. After that, I don't remember anything. I almost died. For some reason, God wanted me to live. They took me Ronald Reagan Hospital at UCLA. I was in coma for three days. I then regained consciousness. The doctors told me I should be dead. I was lucky. The helmet saved my life. That and fireproof jumpsuit, same as that F1 car drivers wear, prevent my demise. They kept me 10 more days and released me. Finally, I packed up my stuff, said bye to my friends, thought about going home, Baltimore. But instead I came here. Nicole, that's a crazy story. I like how you attempted to design a car that flies in the air. It's kind of ambitious. You would have gone the first person who drove a flying car. Ethan, maybe. But not a big deal. I will fix that bitch, and history no history, get it functioning like nothing they've ever seen before. I mean, down the road, humankinds are going to make cars that fly in the air, all kinds of brands like Toyota, Honda, Lexus, Mercedes, and others. Even today, we have the technology to make cars that fly in the air. We just need to use jet engines and take a leap of faith. You know, if someone we have the power to travel in the future with our thought, or suppose there is a time-traveling DeLorean like back to the future and travel 200 years from now. The sky is filled with all kinds of flying cars. They take it for granted. It's like how we can count on any car to drive us to work without a thought. However, imagine, they are myriad stars in the universe just like the sun. And they are countless planets that orbits around those stars. Perhaps, designing car that fly in the air can only take us Los Angeles to Paris. But we still have to think about the fate of this planet. It is not going to be around forever. 
we have to build spaceship that is capable of teleporting through the thin air, explore the universe and find planets that supports life. Nicole, that is something. But I didn't know you're from Baltimore. Ethan, I grew up in Baltimore, moved here when I was 14. I lived with my uncle while finishing high school, graduated at University of California at San Jose with art history at the age of 21. Then moved to Los Angeles, got my master in medieval art at UCLA before I turned 24. Later, I wrote books Romance and Sexuality in Classic Art and the Conscious of Modern Art and Erotic Chronicle, and got my PhD. They thought it was one of the best book ever written in art, and offered me a job at the Department of Art History UCLA to teach. I was the youngest instructor in the history of the school at 28. Girls kept throwing themselves at me as if I were a rock star. I don't know why. Maybe, it's the nature of the subject. I teach art that deals with sexuality. It got even worse. There was article in the newspaper with my picture. The sexiest instructor alive, or the sexiest student in campus, with question mark, asking students to guess if I were a freshman, or a teacher. Nicole, I was going to tell you that you have this lascivious beautiful baby face. Ethan, I don't know about that. But I remember one time I just sat in the classroom with students that I was supposed to teach. You know, checking who was going to stay and who was going to leave. Some student left. They thought the instructor didn't show up. Some stayed because of the class. There is a lot of nudity. I then got up and taught for those who waited, and gave them a. Nicole, do you miss teaching? Ethan, not really. Nicole, how come? Ethan, I wasn't planning to teach forever. You know, I am not a real teacher. I give A to every student. Sometimes, they don't even have to show up to the class. I believe you learn for yourself. No midterm or final exam. I just love art. It comes to me naturally. But there is nothing you can do with art degree, even with PhD, except teaching. Maybe working in the museum as art director. That was about it. I mean you could focus in the business aspect of it, selling and buying, which usually doesn't require any degree. Any high school dropout can do it. Nicole, so, you're telling me that you wasted all your time going to college for nothing. Ethan, no. College is amazing. I learned a lot of things. Maybe, someday I will write a book, nonfiction about the history of art from the beginning to modern day and get back in the game. You know, there are people who might be interested in art history somewhere in this planet. Nicole, who? Ethan, I don't know, maybe some professors looking for some insight, and as ironic as it sounds, college students if they want to write papers. You know, they can grab my book from libraries and get all the information they need about art history. Nicole, why should they get your book instead of others? Ethan, that's a good question. He plants a soft kiss on her shoulder. Ethan, I think I have covered the deepest and the most coquettish classic art and some of the darkest and the most risque modern art history, blended with abstract, metaphors, spirituality, sexuality, and romance as well as anthropology of erotic arts that focus on sensuality, sex, temptation, and seduction with splendid theory that most art historians are afraid to talk about. If that doesn't work, I'll just paint and take a shortcut to fame like Picasso. He plants soft kiss on her shoulder. Nicole, what about the job at the garage? You don't like it? Ethan, that's just to pay my bills, you know, perhaps, work on the flying car and see where it leads. He plants a soft kiss on her shoulder. There is a silent moment. He then. Ethan, what's your story? Nicole, my story is a fairy tale. I was with this guy that I fell in love when I was in high school. He was a little bit older than me, took my virginity, and later moved to Japan. I dated a couple of cute guys here and there, but they all were immature. I then met my husband John two years ago. He is rich, has a nice car. He took me to expensive restaurants. He has a beautiful house. Everything I needed was there. To be honest, I just wanted to live a comfortable life. He asked me to marry him. I agreed reluctantly. Later, I found out he has a violent temper. Sex becomes rape. He's very sadistic. I thought about living him. But something kept me from walking away. It could be my demons. They would rather see me get fucked in the ass, figuratively speaking, and taken care of financially than see me leave, or go somewhere, perhaps Los Angeles and become a movie star like Barbara Stanwyck. Ethan, you are sexiest them of all. Barbara Stanwyck has nothing on you. He plants soft kisses on her shoulder. Nicole, thank for the compliment. But she's my favorite movie star of all time. I wrote paper on her in college. Ethan, did you go to college? Nicole, I went to the University of California at Santa Cruz for two years. I major dance and drama, before I dropped out. Ethan, why did you drop out? Nicole, I was going through a lot of things. You know, my stepfather and my mother were paying my tuition and apartment bill. As a matter of fact, my stepfather was the one who was paying. My mother is a fashion designer. She loves sex and cocaine. My stepfather works at the Microsoft in Silicon Valley, writing software applications. He's the nicest guy you'd ever met in your life. He doesn't say a lot. He just smiles whatever it is, doesn't like to get in argument. I thought he was my real father. My mother never told me who my real father was. She just got pregnant out of the blue and gave birth to me at the age of 17. She raised me alone till I was five. She then married my stepfather. Later, 
she had an affair with a male model slash an aspiring designer. He found out about it. Actually, she told him. They got divorced. My mother moved to New York with her boyfriend. I stayed with my stepfather in Palo Alto. I felt a little bit guilty. You know, he continued to pay my tuition despite the fact what my mother put him through. That was all it took. I dropped out school, moved to Siena with a friend, and began to take dance lesson, hoping to get part on this Broadway production of Chicago while doing a part-time job at Sears. Yet, I met John in the middle while auditioning for a part. His niece happened to be my friend. I met her at the dance school. She was auditioning for a different role. John came to pick us up. We didn't talk much, just introduced each other. Later, one day, he waited for me outside, the dance school, and asked me if I needed a ride home. He had a new car, just brought it to impress me. There were no license plates but a temporary vehicle registration plate. Anyway, I just thought I had nothing to lose, and got in his car. He then asked me out. Actually, he invited me to his house for dinner. It felt a little bit weird. You know, he was more than twice my age. But he's charismatic. He looks ten years younger than his age. Meanwhile, I found out he was a stockbroker in New York City. But he quit and started his own internet brokerage company, selling and buying stocks in the web. He had just bought a breathtaking house for $5 million. It has two swimming pools, a tennis court, a beautiful garden, and all. I think any girl would have gone for it. I wasn't different. We began to date for a while. He then asked me to marry him. I agreed without thinking about the consequence. The rest might not be art. But it's history, which I have already told you, except I stopped dancing. I stopped doing things that I love. I became slave. He provides me with everything. If I need money, he'd give me thousands. If I need a new car, he'd buy for me. Of course, I have to give him my body in return. He'd do whatever it pleases him. You know, all the sadistic things he could think of. I wish I could leave him, and go to a place where dreams come true, like Hollywood, audition for roles, do little things that count, work hard, and become a movie star, or just move to New York City and become a famous burlesque in Broadway. Maybe, I'll have my production company someday and run my own show. But that's just a dream. Ethan, you're the most beautiful girl I have ever seen in my life. You could go to anywhere and do anything. Nobody can stop you. He kisses her on the shoulder. Nicole, some part of me tells me just leave, be famous. It's your destiny. Don't walk away from it. But there is a voice in my head that tells me just don't do anything foolish and get yourself in trouble, like going to Hollywood or Big Apple and straggling. You know, losing myself to drugs like most artists. John thinks he is in love with me. He says he can't live without me. They told him to sign prenup. But he makes me a trustee. If I divorce him, I will get half of his money. His will says I will get the house, the cars, the money, and others, which some might interpret that as love. Basically, he trapped me. I mean. God forbid if something happens to him, I'll inherit everything. She gets up nude, steps out of the bathtub, and walks toward her clothes that's left on the floor. Nicole, I must go home. He'll suspect. She grabs her cloth and puts it on without underwear, still wet. We can see her wet skin through the cloth. She walks up to him, sits by the bathtub with her knee, places her hands inside the water, and touches his private part. Nicole, I had great time. That was the best fuck of my life. She caresses his chest with her hand, gets closer and kisses him. Nicole, I'll see you. She kisses him more seductively. They kiss French. Ethan pulls Nicole and gets her back in the tub. They continue to kiss passionately. Int. Ethan's apartment, Ethan's studio, day. Ethan and Nicole make love. It's passionate, seductive, sensual, and erotic. Pan to, Nicole's dress. We see Nicole's dress by the fireplace drying. Ethan and Nicole continue to go at it. We stay with them with series cuts. Int. Nicole's convertible, moving, sunset. Nicole drives in the street of Siena. EXT Nicole and John's house, night. An established shot of Nicole and John's house. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and parks her car in front of the house. She gets out of her car and walks to the house. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan is fixing the flying car. It is a 2010 custom-made Corvette with F-15 Strike Eagle plain spare part and wings. It looks slick. Nicole come driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at the garage. She is wearing a sunglass. Nicole gets out of the car. Ethan sees her, stops what he was doing, and walks up to her. Nicole, hi. Ethan, what's up? Nicole is in tears. She removes her sunglasses to dry her tears. There is a black mark on her right eye. Ethan, what happened? Nicole, John hit me. He found out that I wasn't wearing underwear. He slapped me with the back of his hand. Ethan, I'm sorry. Nicole, you don't have to be sorry. It's not your fault. I should have left him long time ago. There is a silent moment. He then. Ethan, do you want to go to somewhere quiet and talk? Nicole, sure. Ethan, wait for me at Sophia Coffee Shop, right down the corner of 4th Street. I'll come up with an excuse and take the day off. I'll meet you there in 10 minutes. They kiss. 
Nicole gets in her car and drives away. Ethan walks to Uncle Lou's office. Int. Lou Garage, Uncle Lou's office, day. Uncle Lou is talking on the phone. Ethan steps in. Uncle Lou looks at him and greets him with a nod. Ethan waits for him to finish. Note, we don't hear the other end of the conversation. Lou, the devil got you by the balls. You just have to shake him off. Pause, listening to, they said, let the seraphs in heaven and the demons in hell rumble in your heads. May the angels protect you from evil every minute of your life, but allow the demons to keep you on the edge of chaos. You do what is necessity in order to thrive in this world, get by, and find meaning in life. Pause, listening. The key is to surprise yourself every chance you get. Pause, listening, I know. You can pray day and night. God will give you what you ask for. And as long as there is the very breath of Christ in your soul, nothing will harm you. Yet, one can only take comfort on faith. However, we are here to change the course of our subconscious mind and get somewhere in life. You need a sense of taking something that doesn't belong to you in your essence. That's a game changer. Lou laughs like the devil with his own dry joke, listens to the other end. Lou, take care. Lou hangs up the phone. Lou, what's it, Ethan? Ethan, they brought new jet engine from Seattle. I had to pay them and pick it up. Lou, if you need money for spare parts, just ask me. I want to be a part of the first car that flies in the air. He opens his safe and takes out chunk of money. Here $25,000 for the engine. He places the money in front of him. Ethan takes the money. Ethan, thanks. Lou, if you fly that son of bitch, we are going to start a company like Ford. Ethan, sure. Bye. Lou, take care. Ethan exits the office in a flash. Int. Ethan's Jaguar convertible, moving, day. Ethan drives down the street. He has changed his mechanic cloth. He is wearing a clean cloth, looks good. EXT Sophia Coffee Shop, day. An established shot of Sophia Coffee Shop. It's romantic five-star restaurant. Nicole's convertible is parked at the parking lot. Ethan comes driving and parks his car next to Nicole's convertible. Ethan gets out of his car and walks to the coffee shop. EXT Sophia Coffee Shop, pub, day. Nicole sits at a table in the pub. Ethan sees her. She sees him as well. He comes to her table and sits next to her. Ethan, did you order anything? Nicole, no. A waitress named Emily comes to Ethan and Nicole's table. Emily, what can I get you? Nicole, I'll just have a Diet Coke. Ethan, did you eat lunch? Nicole, no I didn't feel like eating. I had pancake for breakfast. I am full. Ethan, you don't want sandwich or anything. Nicole, it's okay. To the waitress, never mind the coke. Give me a strong Ethiopian coffee, black. Ethan, I'll have chicken sandwich and a coke. Emily, Pepsi or Coca-Cola? Ethan, it doesn't matter. Just bring me Coca-Cola. Emily, I'll be with you in a minute. Emily walks away. Nicole sits closer to Ethan. Nicole, I missed you. Ethan, I missed you too. They kiss. Ethan, are you hurting? Nicole, I'll be fine. They exchange soft kisses. Ethan, he wasn't supposed to touch you. Nicole, he has a violent temper. He slapped me, punched me on the ribs, beat me with his belt and raped me, while chalking me with his tie. I almost died. He came inside my ass and let me go. Ethan, I swear to God if I see that son of a bitch, I'll kill him. He doesn't deserve to live. Nicole, he thinks I go out and fuck guys. Maybe he doesn't care, likes the idea of me getting fucked by ten guys. He's the most sadistic man I have ever met in my life. He does mean things that you wouldn't believe, like he makes me wear sex leather outfit that shows my vulva, ties me on St. Andrew Cross with S&M sex chains, spreads my legs, and hits me on the vagina with cat o nine tails. He then fucked me in the butthole to punish me, when all I need is a man who appreciates me for who I am, like you. Ethan, I will slit his throat and spit on his face. He is as good as dead. They exchange soft kisses. Nicole, I love you, Ethan. Ethan, I love you too. They kiss. Nicole part her lips seductively. Nicole, make love to me. They kiss more intimately. Int. Motel, day. Ethan and Nicole make love. It's steamy, passionate, and seductive. But it's different from the previous sex scenes. They are having a rough sex. They are going at it with various sexual positions. It feels like straight pornography. We stay with them with series cuts. EXT Lou Garage, day. It's Sunday. Ethan is fixing the flying car. The garage is closed. He is the only person at the garage, working overtime figuratively speaking. A man named Robert aka Ghost, 40, comes driving a 1969 Ford Mustang and parks his car at the garage. Robert gets out of the car. Ethan looks at him. He stops what he was doing and walks up to him. Robert opens the trunk. Robert, I have a broken tail light. Inside Robert's trunk, we see all kinds of guns. Ethan looks at the guns. Ethan, you got point three eight. Robert, true romance. I don't fuck with that bitch anymore. Pointing at the guns, I got Desert Eagles, Commando. Sin City. Copra. Puma. V36. Ethan, 
I'll take V36. Robert, that sex pistol. Robert puts it in small lunch bag and hands the gun to Ethan. Robert, $15,000 at the open market. But I'll give you for $2,000. Ethan takes out $2,000 from his pocket and throws it in the trunk. Robert closes the trunk. Robert, thou shall not kill. Ethan, it's for protection. Robert, yeah. It's for protection. My father was fucking my mother doggy style. He told her, bitch, we're going to have a son. I am feeling the Holy Spirit. He's going to go to college and be a rocket scientist. I can feel it on the tip of my dick. It's about to explode inside your pussy like the wrath of God. He's going to space and bring us a couple of stars. Do you know what my mother told him? Shut the fuck up, and fuck me till my bladder bursts and the hairs fall off from my vagina. After it's all said and done, they gave birth to a boy who grew up to be ghost that can see a human spirit through their flesh and knows what they are up to. Nice doing business with you. Ethan says nothing. Roberts gets in his car and drives away. Ethan goes to the garage. Int. Blue garage, repairing room 5, day. Ethan checks out the gun. Lolita comes out of nowhere. Lolita, ha. Ethan quickly hides the gun behind his back. Ethan, ha. Lolita, what are you hiding? Ethan, nothing. Lolita, it's a gun. I saw it. Ethan, it's not what you think it's. I mean I got it for protection. Lolita, I don't care. I won't tell anybody. Let me see it. Ethan, no. Lolita, it's not like the first time that I saw a gun. Guys bring guns to school all the time. I have fired a couple of guns in the woods myself. Ethan, that's your business. I can't be held responsible if I'm not there to stop you. Lolita, I just want to look at it. Ethan gives her the gun. Lolita holds the gun. Lolita, it's a beautiful gun. Where did you get it? Ethan, I can't tell you that. It's confidential. Lolita, I'm just asking. I don't care. Lolita is kind of taken by the gun's beauty. Lolita, is it loaded? Ethan, I doubt it. Maybe there is a bullet in the chamber. I didn't check, just got it. Lolita points the gun at him. Lolita, I'll give you a choice. Either you make love to me here in the garage, on you flying car, or I'll shoot you in the heart. The choice is yours. Lolita removes her underwear while pointing the gun at him. She throws her underwear away. Lolita, I'll make easier for you. You can put it anywhere you want to. She gets closer and kisses him. Hint. Blue garage, repairing room 5, day. Ethan is fucking Lolita doggy style, bending her against the flying car. She is making all kinds of sexual noise and talking dirty. Lolita talking dirty fuck me harder. Ethan just wants to get it done with it, and can't help but increases the speed. Lolita, that's so sweet. EXT Lou Garage, day. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and parks her car at Lou Garage. She gets out of the car and walks toward Garage 5. EXT slash int. Lou Garage, repairing room 5, day. Ethan continues to fuck Lolita behind. Then they both reach climax. At the entrance, Nicole sees them. Ethan looks at her. Nicole turns around and runs toward her car. Ethan, no. Fuck. Nicole. Ethan grabs his pants from the floor and begins to put it on. Lolita sits in the sofa exhausted. Lolita, you're fucking Jesus Christ. You got my J-spot. J stand for joy. You make me come three time less than 25 minutes. Ethan places the gun in his belt and runs after Nicole. EXT Lou Garage, day. Nicole gets in her car and drives away. Ethan runs to his Jaguar, gets behind the wheel, starts the car, and follows her. Montage. Series shots of Ethan following Nicole in the streets of Siena. Nicole makes a right turn and continues to drive down the street. Ethan makes a right turn and continues to follow her. Medium shots of Ethan and Nicole's cars driving in the streets of Siena. Close, up, Nicole as she continues to drive. She looks at Ethan in the rearview mirror. Close, up, Ethan as he continues to follow her. Nicole makes another right turn and continues to drive down the road. Ethan does the same and continues to follow her. An established shot of Ethan and Nicole's cars moving in the street of Siena. Various shots of Ethan's car and Nicole's car driving in the street of Siena. Nicole makes a left turn and continues to drive down the street. Ethan continues to follow her. Nicole then stops in the middle of the street, gets out of the car, comes to the front, and sits on the edge of her car, on the tip of hood. She takes out a cigarette, lights it, and begins to smoke. Ethan pulls behind Nicole's car, gets out of his car, and walks up to her. Ethan, I'm sorry. Nicole, why are you sorry? She gets up from the hood. Ethan, it's just. I'm stupid. She breathes the smoke at his face. Nicole, you're not stupid. I'm still with my husband. He fucks me in a daily base. You don't see me apologizing, even though I want to kill myself every time he touches me. Ethan, you have no choice. But I do. Nicole, we all have choices to some degree. I can walk away and see what fate has in store for me. Perhaps, some of us don't like the choices we have. We get stuck. Sometimes, it's worst, we suffer greatly even though it's not our fault. I feel like a bird kept on a cage. I thought you were going to free me. Ethan, 
I will free you, even it means my life. Nicole, I know you will. I love you. Ethan, I love you too. They kiss. Ethan, I am sorry. You're the most beautiful girl in the universe. I should have built a cathedral in my soul, and worshipped you with every beat of my heart, instead of screwing some girl that I don't give a fuck about. Nicole, I'm not mad at you. Ethan, forgive me. You deserve better. I'll make up it to you. As a matter of fact, I will call that flying car after you, Nicole. It's the first flying car. Nicole, I appreciate that. They exchange soft kisses. Ethan, I swear I would never do anything that might upset you again. I would cut my penis off and feed it to a coyote. Nicole, just shut up and kiss me. They kiss French. Nicole, before you cut off your penis and feed it to a coyote, I want you to make love to me here, in the middle of the street. Ethan and Nicole kiss more intimately. Nicole opens his pants. Ethan kisses her on the neck. Ethan grabs her buttocks and places her on the hood. He tenderly removes her underwear and throws it away. He removes his pant completely, gets between her legs. They kiss lasciviously. Ethan then enters her as they begin to have sex in the middle of nowhere. A car passes by them. The driver turns around and looks at them. Ethan and Nicole continue to have sex, as if they were the only two heartthrobs exist in solar system. Int. Hotel and resort, bedroom, night. Ethan and Nicole make love. It's passionate, seductive, and steamy. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Hotel and resort, bathtub, day. Ethan and Nicole are in the bathtub. Ethan is behind. Nicole rests on his chest in romance. She is holding V36 that Ethan just bought in black market. Nicole, it's a beautiful gun. Thanks. Ethan, think nothing of it. They kiss. Nicole parts her lips and rests on Ethan's chest. She puts the gun on the floor. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, there is something that I didn't tell you. John is a con artist. He ran a boiler room dealing in stocks, a firm that runs a pump and dump scam in the internet. He has stashed $100 million in a safe, hidden behind the wall at the basement. Ethan, that's a lot of money. Nicole, he told me the combination in case something happens to him. God forbid, if something happens to him, all I have to do is, break the walls, take the money, move to Venice, and spend the rest of my life in Italy with you. They kiss. Nicole, what do you think of spending the rest of our lives in Europe? Ethan, what are you trying to tell me? Nicole, nothing. Ethan, do you want me to kill him? Nicole, would you kill a man for money, or love? Ethan, for love. They kiss passionately. Int. Hotel and resort, bedroom, night. Nicole lies on the bed. Ethan leans next to her. They both are nude, smoking weed. Ethan, we just can kill him and expect to get away. We have to be five step ahead of the game. He plants a soft kiss on her lips. Ethan, we have to make it look like accident. Here this is how we're going to do it. I'll come at night and lose his break. There is this cliff in St. Pleasure. He gives her a soft kiss on the lips. Ethan, you'll drive St. Pleasure around 3 a.m. in the morning. When you get there, you'll give him a call and tell him your car broke down. Then ask him to pick you up. I'll follow him, there won't be no cars around that time, and drive him off the cliff. Nicole, that's a wonderful plan. He takes a drag from the weed, gives her a shotgun, breathes the smoke down by her lips, and kisses her lips as she lets out the smoke with her nostril. She puts her arms around him. They kiss passionately. Ethan puts the weed aside and caresses her neck as they begin to make love. Int. Restaurant, night. It's a fancy five stars restaurant. Nicole and John sit at a table and have dinner, sushi and steak with glasses of red wines. Nicole is wearing a beautiful black dress. She hasn't touched her meal, sushi. She's just playing with it. She is lost in thought, poking the sushi with a chopstick. John, why aren't you eating? Nicole, I'm not hungry. John, why did you order? Nicole, I was hungry. There is a pause. John wants more explanation, but Nicole says nothing. John continues to eat. He then. John, I'm told when people are hungry, they eat. But it seems you are playing with your food. Nicole, since I'm not going to eat it, I might as well play with it. John, is that the story of your life? Nicole, no. The story of my life is I'm too hazardous for hearts. Nobody can't keep me in a cage. John, that's quote of the day. But do you mind asking why you choose not to eat? Nicole, it's not a choice. I just lost my appetite. There is a silent moment. John continues to eat. He then. John, where did it go? Nicole, what go where? John, your appetite. You said you lost it? I might as well call the police and ask them to look for your appetite if it's still around. Nicole, pretty funny. John smiles to himself and resumes eating. Yet, he doesn't want to let it go. John, you just can't lose your appetite. I mean one minute you were hungry. The next minute, you lost your appetite. It sounds like you're having a split personality. Nicole, it does, doesn't it? John, I'm just saying. You should eat something. You don't want to starve yourself to death. Nicole, I'm not starving myself to death. 
I'm turning to vegetarian. John, what do you mean you're turning to vegetarian? Nicole, I don't eat meat. John, why is that? Nicole, vegetarians don't eat meat. John, how come? Nicole, we do it out of the kindness of our hearts. John, explain that to me. Nicole, if you are vegetarian, you're not supposed to eat animals. It's not right. Animals are like us. They have emotion. We're supposed to take care of them. What's next? Are we going to eat human? We shouldn't hurt them. John, maybe, you got a point. But Susie is not meat. Nicole, it's made of fish. It is meat. John, if you say so. John continues to eat while thinking what he is going to say next. He then. John, do you know there are Catholics, who don't eat meat, but they eat fish. Nicole, I'm not Catholic. John, what are you? Nicole, I just believe in nothing. There is pause. John waits for her to say more. Nicole says nothing. John, you just believe in nothing. What does that mean? Nicole, it means I don't belong to any religion. I'm a goddess starting my own religion. I believe in self-actualization. John, that's a powerful statement. But you are contradicting yourself. One minute, you care for animals that are defenseless. The next minute, you're a goddess. You want people to worship you, make animal sacrifice, and pay respect to you, cutting sheep throat, skin them while their heart's still beating, and all. You then drink its blood warm, and eat the liver raw. I could be wrong. But I don't see any vegetable in your religions. Maybe the sheep or cow has grazed too many grass. You could easily get away with it, see no evil, hear no evil, kill no evil, eat no evil. However, are you sure you don't have a split personality? Nicole, if I have a split personality, you'll be the first to know. John, maybe split personality is a label. You know, it's just another complex emotion. But have you thought about the notion that you might be the third coming of Christ, the female version of the light the truth the way? You know, Jesus has blessed the fish. He has turned water to wine. If you eat that sushi, it will prepare you for a kingdom. You might want to teach in parables. Jesus taught in parables. Nicole, I don't know a lot of things about Jesus. But a couple of guys were about to stone a woman, whom they accused of adultery. He told them let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. John, that's what they did in those days. If they found you guilty of adultery, they would stone you to death. But luckily that woman ran into Jesus, and he saved her life. However, do you know Jesus also said, for God so loved the world, that. She takes over in the middle of the sentence. Nicole, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 John, that's right. It is John 3.16. I know you were just fronting. You're a Christian. Nicole, no, I'm not. It's just a little tenet that I picked up at a Catholic school where they teach you to preserve your virginity till marriage. John, let me take a wild guess. They expected you to go along with the doctrine. But the angels in heaven forgot to tell them that girls have clitoris. When it's stimulated, your brain release chemicals that are responsible for euphoria, which eventually lead to sexual intercourse. Then preservation of virginity till marriage becomes Latin mythology. Nicole, they didn't forget to tell them. They quizzed us every week. This girl used to eat my pussy in the classroom. I lost my virginity to four guys in the church. They ganged up on me, and fucked me till I lost faith in Miley Cyrus. It wasn't rape, or anything. I just let them fuck me after I caught my boyfriend fucking my best friend in a classroom. So, in order to get even, I invited four guys to my house. They were college football players. One of them lived a block from my house. I showed them a pornography video that my mother and stepfather kept in the closet. I told them to take my virginity, however, wanted them to do it in the church. We drove to school with a video camera. Broke into the cathedral. They tore my dress and fucked me while taking turns, and recording the sex. It wasn't that painful. As a matter of fact, that was one of the best sex in my life. They fucked me every hole they could find in my body, and came on my ass, breasts, lips, and face. I was mad at my boyfriend. I was mad at God. I was mad at love. I was mad at life. I was mad at everything. It was my way of saying, fuck you to all of them. I showed the video to my boyfriend and broke up with him, and then burned it out of frustration. But the guys, whom took my virginity, had copies. I once borrowed a copy from my neighbor, and watched it while touching myself as if the devil were fucking me. It is porn classic. Nobody has done it in the church. I am the only person who had sex in the house of God, not with one guy but four. She is messing with his head. We don't even know if she is telling the truth or a lie. It's hard to read her eyes. John takes a sip from his wine. John, I have nothing but respect for you. Let's put that theology and the four wise men aside for a while, and hope the girl that ate you is not a vegetarian. It might ruin my day. Yet let me ask you this. You said that vegetarian don't eat meat. It's taboo. Meat has protein. I'm just wondering. Where are you going to get your protein? Never mind. That's a stupid question, joking, my balls produce more protein than 50 grown stallions, and those four clowns that you fucked in the church. I think you are set for life, 
just make sure you swallow it. Since it's not new, you can even use the protein cream after I come on your face. It's approved by Food and Drug Administration. Nicole is not smiling. She is insulted, but collects her composure. She knows she is going to get him, yet pretends she is upset. John looks at her eyes and senses she is not happy. John, I'm sorry sweetheart. I don't mean to piss you off. I don't really give a fuck about guys that you fucked before I met you. It's your past. It has nothing to do with the present. I hope it won't affect the future. I just thought you should eat something. It does not have to be meat. You can order fruit or vegetable, whatever it is. But put something in that tummy. You don't want to look skeleton like those Hollywood girls that looks like dolls without a single bit of meat in their bodies. It's bad for sex. You know, I don't want to break my fingers when I slap your butt during sex, while your bone sticking out on the side of your buttocks. I am considering changing career to a hand model. I am told broken fingers and hand modeling don't go together. He got her this time. Nicole, go fuck yourself. She crashes her meal and the drink on the floor, gets up, and walks away. John smiles at her in sarcasm. Int. Coffee shop, day. Ethan and Nicole sit at a table with cups of coffees. Nicole, we have to do it as soon as possible. Ethan, if we rush it, things will go wrong. We'll end up in prison, instead of French Rivera. Nicole, we're going to Venice, not French Rivera. Ethan, don't make any different. They kiss. Ethan, I'll come Friday. You'll leave the garage door open, wait, did you get the pill that you were telling me about? Nicole, yes, I did. Ethan, I don't want him to come while I'm loosening the brake. If he shows up, things might get ugly. Nicole, don't worry. I got it in black market. I told a friend that works at a pharmacy I had insomnia. She sold it to me. Ethan, it's good. Nicole, I thought about getting him drunk, you know, sometimes, we just sit and drink till 3 in the morning. He's sort of alcoholic. Ethan, you don't want him to get too drunk. He'll fall in a deep sleep and might never wake up when you call him. Instead, just give him the pill early. It'll put him to sleep for a while. They continue to talk. We pull out of the coffee shop dexterously. Int. Nicole and John's house, living room, night. Nicole is at the private bar. She pours whiskey in a glass, places a pill in the drink and spins it with her middle finger till it dissolves. Nicole comes to John who is sitting in the sofa and watching movie The Lady Eve starring Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda. Nicole gives him the drink and sits next to him, resting her head on his lap. John caresses her hair as he takes sips while watching the movie. Nicole is watching the movie as well. Nicole, did I miss anything? John, no really. They were just talking about this and that. You know, Jean is about to get even with Pike. She said she had unfinished business with him. She needed him like the axe needed the turkey. Nicole, under her breath I see. John, but don't worry. She'll end up falling head over heels in love with him. It's double feature The Lady Eve and Lady of Burlesque featuring your favorite actress Barbara Stanwyck. John takes a sip and puts his drinks aside. Nicole gets up. Nicole, anyway, I feel dirty. Let me take a shower. She goes to upstairs climbing the staircase. Int. Nicole and John's house, bathtub, night. Nicole takes off her clothes, walks to the shower nude, turns on the faucet and begins to take shower. Int. Nicole and John's house, living room, night. John is sleeping. On the TV, Lady of Burlesque is shown. Nicole comes down the stair wearing a shower dress and looks at John. She takes out her cell phone from her pocket and dials Ethan. Int. John and Nicole's house slash Ethan's Ford truck, night. Ethan sits in a 1999 Ford truck drinking whiskey from a hip flask. His phone rings up. He picks it up. Note, we see both sides of the conversation. Nicole, on the phone he is sleeping. Ethan, on the phone I'll be there in two minutes. They both hang up the phone. We stay with Nicole. Nicole turns around and looks at Barbara Stanwyck in Lady of Burlesque. Int. Nicole and John's house, garage, night. Ethan is in the middle of loosening the brake in John's Cadillac Eldorado Beeritz convertible. Nicole stands and watches him. Nicole, how long it's going to take? Ethan, I'm almost done. Five minutes the maximum. Nicole, so, what's the plan? What time should I drive to St. Pleasure? Ethan, go around 2.45 a.m. You'll get there around 3.15. Like I told you, use that payphone in the 25th street. Nicole, what if he asks me what I'm doing there that late? Ethan, what did we talk about? Ethan listens to what she has to say about the plan while loosening the brake. Nicole, I'll tell him that my friend broke up with her boyfriend. They got in a fight. He kicked her out of the house in the middle of the night. She called me. He was sleeping. I didn't want to wake him up. So, I went there by myself to give her a ride. But my car broke down in the middle of the street before I picked her up. Now, I need a ride. Ethan, that's perfect. Ethan continues to work on the car, placing worn out brakes and putting the parts back as Nicole watches him. He looks magician. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Nicole's car, moving, night. Nicole drives in the street of St. Pleasure. EXT Nicole's car, moving, night. 
medium shot of Nicole in her Chevy Corvette convertible driving in the road of St. Pleasure. We see a scary cliff on the side of the road. Int. Nicole's car, moving, night. Close, up, Nicole. She seems clam as spring weather. EXT Nicole's car, moving, night. An established shot of Nicole's Chevy Corvette convertible as she continues to drive. EXT St. Pleasure, 25 Street, phone booth, night. Nicole comes driving and parks her car next to the phone booth. She gets out of her car, and walks up to the phone booth. Nicole picks up the phone and calls John. Int. John and Nicole's house, kitchen slash EXT phone booth, night. John is in the kitchen drinking beer from a bottle. He has a slice of pizza in the microwave, warming. His cell phone is on the kitchen counter. It rings up like a bad bell. John quickly picks it up as if he were expecting the call. He knew who it was. Note, we see both sides of the conversation. Nicole, on the phone hi, it's me. John, on the phone where are you? Nicole, I'm at 25th Street 6495 St. Pleasure. My car broke down in the middle of the street. John, what are you doing in St. Pleasure? Nicole, I went to pick my friend. She got into a fight with her girlfriend. She kicked her out of the house. I thought you might like her. She's lesbian, but doesn't mind engaging in threesome with a straight guy. It was supposed to be a surprise for your birthday. John, my birthday won't come for another two months. Nicole, why can't we celebrate tonight? John, is she with you? Nicole, no, she's not. We'll pick her up together when you get here. John, is it your new number? Nicole, no. My cell phone battery died. It's a payphone. John, wait for me. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Nicole, bye. She hangs up. We stay with Nicole. Nicole walks toward her car. She takes out a disposable cell phone from her purse and calls Ethan. EXT Nicole's car slash Ethan's Ford truck, night. Ethan picks up the phone and talks to Nicole. Note, we see both sides of the conversation. Ethan, what's up? Nicole, he's in his way to pick me up. Ethan, sure. Stay put. I'll give you a call when it's done. Nicole, be careful. Ethan, don't worry. I got everything under control. Nicole, I love you. Ethan, I love you too. They both hang up the phone. We stay with Nicole. She takes out a cigarette, lights it up, takes a cool long drag, and breathes out the smoke seductively. EXT John's Cadillac, moving, night. John drives in the street of Siena. EXT Ethan's Ford truck, moving, night. Ethan follows John's Cadillac from a fair distance. Shots of John's Cadillac slash Ethan's Ford truck, moving. John makes a left turn and continues to drive down the road. Ethan makes a left turn as well, and continues to follow John. Int. Ethan's Ford truck, moving, night. Close, up, Ethan. Ethan looks calm and ready to take him out. EXT John's Cadillac slash Ethan's Ford truck, moving, night. John drives in the road of St. Pleasure. The street is deserted. There is nothing. We see the same scary clip that we saw previously. Ethan continues to follow John. Int. Ethan's Ford truck, moving, night. Close, up, Ethan. It's time to make a move. We can see it in his eyes. Ethan steps on the gas and accelerates. John's Cadillac slash Ethan's Ford truck. Ethan hits John's car behind. John loses control. Ethan bangs the car again. John's car trembles out of direction. John steps on the brake. But the brake doesn't work. The Cadillac continues to skid. Ethan smacks the Cadillac with his Ford dexterously. John's Cadillac falls over the cliff and crashes down the cliff. Ethan pulls over at the side of the road, grabs a small container of gas from the cargo container, goes down the cliff, and comes to John's Cadillac. Ethan pours the gas on John's car, takes out a match, lights it, and sets the Cadillac on fire. Ethan turns around, walks away from the fire, climbs the hill, and returns to the car. EXT Ethan's Ford truck, night. Ethan gets behind the wheel, starts the car, and drives away. EXT Nicole's car, night. Nicole stands next to her car, waiting for Ethan while smoking cigarette. Ethan comes driving and pulls next to her car, across the street. Ethan gets out of the car, crosses the street, and approaches her. Nicole throws her cigarette away. Ethan and Nicole cuddle and kiss French. Ethan, we can't be seen together for a while, must stay away from each other till things cool down. Nicole, I can't live without you. I love you. Ethan, I love you too. They kiss more passionately. Ethan, let's get out of here. Nicole gets in her car, starts the engine, and drives away. Ethan returns to his car, gets behind the wheel, starts the cars, and drives away, following Nicole's car. EXT John's accident scene, day. John's car is completely burned to black. It looks bad. There is nothing left of John that the police could work with. Detective Matt Jones and Detective Roy Moore, who is smoking, are in the middle of collecting evidence. Matt, what do you think? Roy, the driver was drunk, fell asleep, and drove off the cliff. His car leaked gas, and set in fire. Case close. Matt, I might have to disagree with you. Suppose you put a dummy in the car, and drive him off the same cliff. 
I will bet you a million dollar. The car wouldn't set on fire like this. It only happens in movies. Roy, so, what are you suggesting? Matt, it's homicide. Roy, let's find out who he is and get to work on people that he knows. Matt, joking I think he's a spy. Look at his car. 1959 Cadillac Eldorado Beeritz Convertible. It's classic. CIA might have killed him. They found out he was selling secrets to the Russian, traveling through time machine, and they took him out. Roy, you and your endless conspiracy theories will get you killed one of these days. Matt, as long as I do my job right, I'll go heaven and sit in God's right hand. Roy, humorously I'll come and sit next to you when my time is up. Matt, it's not like that I'm not afraid of death. That bitch scares me more than the voices in my head and a dead corpse that is buried six feet beneath the ground. But you have to be willing to die for what you believe. Roy, what do you believe in? Matt, sex, whiskey, and rock and roll, baby. Matt and Roy continue to work on the crime scene. Music plays on the soundtrack. We then pull out dexterously. EXT Nicole's house, day. Nicole sits at a table next to the swimming pool. She is wearing a sexy swimsuit that shows most of her skin. Matt and Roy sits at the same table and question her. Breakfast has already served. Matt, when is the last time you saw your husband? Nicole, around 3 a.m. in the morning. He just got up in the middle of the night and left. Matt, did you ask him where he was going? Nicole, no I was asleep. Matt, so how did you know he left 3 a.m.? Nicole, I didn't. I just guessed. You could say I was half asleep, heard sound or something, opened my eyes and saw him getting up. I thought he was going to the bathroom, didn't bother to ask where he was going. I was tired. Matt, how come you were tired? Nicole, I did aerobic exercise right before I went bed, ran on the treadmill. Roy, do you always do aerobic exercise right before you go to bed? Nicole, occasionally, when I need to exercise. Roy, what do you do, Mrs. Fox? Nicole, I'm a dancer. Roy, where do you dance? Nicole, what do you mean where I dance? Roy, are you a professional dancer? Nicole, no, I'm not. Roy, amateur. Nicole, whatever that is, but I don't like how it sounds. Matt, it only means you're not paid to dance. You do it for recreation. Nicole, thanks for clarifying it. There is a pause. Nicole takes out a cigarette and looks at Roy who is looking at her eyes with sexual desire. Roy lights her cigarette. Roy, is there anything you want to tell us? Nicole, not really. Roy, why did you choose to dance? Nicole, I'm thinking about going to Hollywood and becoming an actress. I hope it's not hard to memorize dialogues. I would love to play a dancing detective. Matt, did Mr. Fox tell you where he was going that night? Nicole, no. Matt, did he talk about his work? Nicole, we never talked about his work. Matt, what about his will, is there anything you want to tell us about it? Nicole, what are you suggesting, am I a suspect? Matt, no. It's only a routine. I asked you to get it out of my system. Nicole, maybe, I should talk to my lawyer. It's a lot of money, the house, the car, insurance. It's easy to blame the wife. Matt, it's all right. No need for a lawyer. You're fine. Take care. Matt gives Roy a nod let's get out of here. They get up. Matt, we'll see you some other time. Roy, good luck with Hollywood. You will make a dazzling movie star. Nicole, thanks. Roy, bye. Nicole, bye. They leave in ease. The camera stay with Nicole. She takes a drag from her cigarette, gives us a wink, and breathes out the smoke at the screen with style. Int. Police department, Matt and Roy's office, day. Roy sits at his desk. Matt stands holding John's file. They are in the middle of discussing about the case. Matt, the guy spent two years in prison for stock market security fraud in New York. He paid his dues, moved to San Francisco, and started his own internet brokerage company. There is not a lot of record on him. He's clean. Roy is smoking cigarette. Roy, I don't trust those stoke brokers. They know more tricks than the devil. They're robbing people blind. Matt, that's beside the point. Get this, his wife is the sole inherent of his property and life insurance. The will is under her name. Who knows? She might have him killed in cold blood. Roy, you saw how beautiful she is. She can seduce Bill Gates if she wants to. He'd leave his wife and marry that chick in a heartbeat. She'd take half of his billions and leave him without bad feelings, but alluring pain in the heart. What the fuck she's going to do with a house, couple of insurance money and a will? She could go to Hollywood and make that in one picture. She doesn't even have to say a single word. Matt, fuck Hollywood bullshit. She has something to do with his death. Not only she is getting his insurance money and millions from his will. She's also getting $5 million that he made this year from his online stock brokerage company. The company itself is worth $10 million. She might end up with $30 million. Roy, she is worth a billion dollar after tax. Matt, sarcastically my dick will be worth a billion dollar, if I fuck that bitch in the armpit. I will keep an eye on her. Roy, joking keep both of your eyes on her. But make sure you take lotion with you before you fuck her in the armpit. 
If you take shampoo, you might start comedy club. No girl will able to resist your charm. It could bring you a lot of audiences. But simultaneously, that might cause distraction. Matt, playing alone I prefer lotion myself. I am not much of a clown but a lover. Roy, I am not here to judge you. But how do you fuck a woman in the armpit? I mean the way I pictured it. A French woman with a lot of hair on her armpit. You apply shampoo on it and fuck her straight in the armpit till she pees out of laughter. Or you would stand behind her. She makes a tiny space between her arm and side muscle, latissimus dorsi, just right down by her armpit, can be adjusted, depends on the requirement. Let's just go to the point. You pour down the lotion there, then insert your dick in her armhole, and fuck her till you shoot the semen in the air. She then does a chicken dance with her one arm for you. Roy does a chicken dance with one arm to demonstrate what he means. Matt can't help but smile sardonically. Matt, I will go with the latter. But after I am done with her, she will do break dancing with both of her arms. Roy, as long as she doesn't start rapping, you will be fine. Matt, I am not fucking her mouth. I am fucking her armhole. But if I were fucking her mouth, no one could prevent that, except she won't be rapping. I would come deep in her throat. She will break a glass with her voice like Mariah Carey. Roy, I am not quite there yet. I am still trying to keep the rhythm in the background, and get girls sing blues. Nonetheless, if I see you with a girl, I will remember to keep the glasses away from that diva. Matt, I will not worry too much about glasses breaking. I would be more concerned about she starting to speak in tongue, confessing her sins, and biting like a vicious dog than then screaming. Roy, I can picture Mrs. Fox speaking in tongue. I could live with that. But if she starts biting, we might have to keep her confined in a mask like Hannibal Lecter in the Silence of the Lambs, though I would tie her spread eagle to stop you from fucking her in the armpit. Matt, I guess, that would leave me no choice but to fuck her in the breasts. Roy, that mean I get the pussy. Matt, you tied her spread eagle. You might as well keep the pussy. Roy, what about the ass, who is going to get that? Matt, we take turns on the ass. You get it on odd days. I get it on even days. Roy, that is fair enough. Matt, however, the little voice in the back of my head is telling me, I can't live without pussy. It's not fair. We should share it. You get it in weekdays, the exception of Friday. I get it on Friday and weekends. I am not greedy. Roy, let's not negotiate to curb our enthusiasm, but to give the girl pure pleasure, the best fuck of her life. We are neither going to tie her, nor put a mask on her face, but set her free. Her movement will not be restricted. We will allow her to do whatever she pleases. Are you down with threesome? Matt, I am down like Satan and his fallen angels in hell. They share small laughter as if they were talking nonsense to keep themselves lighthearted and happy-go-lucky with humor. The last couple of lines will be edited during filming. Roy, anyway, I'll stay away from the case. Tomorrow is my last day. I am starting chemo on Tuesday for lung cancer. You are your own. Matt, so... Why are you still smoking? Roy, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. It's breathing in vain that cause cancer. Matt, just take it easy. Roy, you should take a vacation as well. You have nothing. No jury is going to believe you if you go to the court that she hired someone to kill her husband to get his insurance money. Matt, I have this weird feeling in my belly. The little man is acting up like Edward Eugene in double indemnity. I can't trust myself when I'm near her. She's a beautiful sin. But I know she got him killed. I'll prove it one way or another. We pull out dexterously, as they continue to talk. Int. Nicole's house, basement, night. Ethan is in the middle of hammering the wall with a sledgehammer. It's loud. The wall crumble. Chunks of rocks fall on the floor. Ethan has his shirt off. His mouth is covered with mask to protect him from dust. Nicole stands in the back watching. Her mouth is covered with mask as well. Ethan continues to hit the wall. He pierces a hole through the wall. Ethan keeps on hammering as if he were looking for a diamond the size of Stanley Cup. The house is covered with a lot of dust. A big section of the wall comes down, revealing a safe. Ethan hits the wall harder making more space till it has room to get into the safe. Int. Nicole's house, basement, later. There is a huge hole in the wall. We see a big thick safe. Ethan clears the way, removing the rock that falls on the floor. Nicole walks to the safe with a piece of paper that have combination number. She applies the code and tries to open the door. It's not working. Ethan, it's not working? Nicole, let me try it again. She applies the code and tries to open it but it's the wrong combination. Nicole, it's weird. Why doesn't it work? Nicole knows the answer. Ethan, he must have given you a wrong combination. Nicole, maybe. She tries it again. It doesn't work. Ethan, don't sweat it. I'll find someone who can open safes. They kiss. Nicole, referring to the rocks who is going to clean this. I don't want the police to walk here and see the safe. They'll suspect. Ethan, don't worry. I'll take care of it. They kiss more intimately. EXT Nicole and John's house, night. Ethan, wearing a ski hat, comes driving his Ford truck, and parks the car in the garage. Ethan is supporting a fake mustache. Int. Nicole and John's house, garage, night. 
Nicole is present. We see six sack of rocks and dirt next to the garage wall. Ethan gets out of the car and begins to load them one by one, he carries a sack on his shoulder and places it in the cargo container. Ethan places all of them. Nicole walks up to Ethan as he approaches her. Nicole, what's next? Ethan, we can't be see together, especially in the daytime. They exchange soft kisses. Nicole, I meant. She puts her arms around him. Nicole, how are we going to open it? They exchange soft kisses. Ethan, I'll find someone. They exchange juicy kisses. Nicole, how can we trust them? They exchange kisses. Ethan, we have no choice. We'll pay them handsomely. They kiss more intimately. EXT Ethan's Ford truck, moving, dawn. Ethan drives in the street of Siena. The sun breaks the cloud and covered the sky with beautiful orange and gold twilight. Int. Ethan's Ford truck, moving, dawn. Ethan takes out a cigarette, lights it and begins to smoke. He then looks at the rear view mirror. Unmarked police car is following him. Ethan steps on the gas and drives faster. EXT Ethan's Ford truck slash unmarked police car, moving, dawn. The police car follows him. Int. Unmarked police car, moving, morning. Matt is behind the wheel, thinks about calling a backup, but changes his mind for unknown reason. He puts his radio back and continues to follow him. Ethan's Ford truck slash Matt's police car, moving. Series shots of Ethan getting away and Matt following him. Ethan continues to get away. He is a natural born driver, as if he knew where to turn, where to speed, where to slow down, which alleyways to drive, passing all kinds cars that happen to be driving in the morning. As good as Ethan is, Matt keeps up with him. Ethan makes a right turn and drives in an alleyway. Matt makes the same turn and continues to follow him. Ethan gets out of the alleyway and makes a dangerous cut through a light morning traffic. Matt tries to do the same. But Nissan comes from a blind side and hits his car. Matt's unmarked police car is smoking. Matt is okay. It's not a major accident. He shakes it off, gets out of the car, and walks to the Nissan to see if the driver in the Nissan is okay. Meanwhile, Ethan makes a clean getaway. Int. Ethan's Ford truck, moving, morning. Ethan looks clam, slows down a little bit, makes a left turn, and continues to drive down the street, making an authentic escape. EXT Ethan's Ford truck, moving, morning. An established shot of Ethan's car driving down the street. EXT Lake, day. Ethan comes driving the Ford truck through the bush and stops near the lake. We notice Ethan has already gotten rid of the sacks of rocks and dirt from his car. Ethan puts the car in gear and gets out of the car. Ethan comes behind the car, and pushes it into the lake. The Ford truck floats a little bit and drowns completely. Ethan walks through the bush and comes to a 2010 Toyota Camry that he must have left behind, hidden. Int. Ethan's Toyota, day. Ethan gets behind the wheel, starts the car, and drives through the bushes. EXT Ethan's Toyota, moving, day. Medium shot of Ethan's Toyota driving in the bushes. Ethan then gets on a regular street and drives down the road. We take it with overhead shot. Int. Bar, night. Matt sits at a table with a glass of whiskey. A man named Richard, looks between 45 to 50, walks in with an envelope. He comes and sits at Matt's table. Richard places the envelope in front of Matt. Matt opens the envelope. There are photographs inside the envelopes. Matt pulls the photos and looks at them. We see photos of Ethan and Nicole taken before the murder. Matt, referring to Ethan who's he? Richard, some guy that she was fucking behind her husband. John hired me to follow her. I took a couple of pictures of them and thought about showing to him, but changed my mind at the last minutes. I felt if he saw those pictures, he would kill her. You see, not only am I a private investigator, but I was also his friend. I knew him in New York City. He isn't what you think he was. If you look his background, you will find out. He was one of the greatest con artists in 21 century. I'm talking about serious money. He scammed $100 million stock investors money, changed his name, and disappeared from the face of the earth, or rather set up a small internet brokerage company and laid low. His real name is Carter. He stashed the money at his basement. You should check it out. Matt, why are you telling me this for, I mean what's it for you? Richard, nothing. I'm dying, had brain cancer, tumor size of tennis balls inside my skull. It's non-operational. They gave me two months to live. Matt, what is the world coming to? Every person I know is dying with cancer. They have to find cure for that crab before it wipes out the entire humanity. Richard, I am sure they are doing something about it. Matt, I'm sorry to hear that you have to go out like that. Richard, it's cool. I've lived my life to the fullest. I just thought you can help that poor girl. She might have gotten herself in the mix. I didn't want anyone to hurt her. I asked the department who was handling the case. Your name came up. That's how I was able to track you down. Richard gets up. Richard, I have to go. Take care. Richard walks toward the exit. Matt looks at the photos. When he looks up. Richard's is gone. Matt turns his eyes and looks at the photo of Nicole for long seconds. Int. John and Nicole's house, night. Nicole walks up to the door and opens it, revealing Detective Matt. Detective Matt shows her his badge. He's carrying the envelope. 
Matt, can I come in? Nicole lets him in. She leads him to the main living room. Main living room. Nicole and Matt come to the living room. Nicole, do you want anything to drink? Matt, scotch. Nicole comes to her private bar, grabs a bottle of scotch, and pours the liquor in two separate glasses. Matt looks around the living room. He thinks it's impressive. Matt comes up to the bar. Nicole gives him his drink. Matt takes it and has a sip. Matt, everybody has a vice. I don't care if you are Julia Roberta, or the Queen of England, or Buddha. Some do cocaine. Others drink. There are those who eat excessively. Some smoke. Some are into weird sex. Some people are just greedy. There are people who don't do anything. They are those who have anger problems. And my favorite, those who kill. All that's deadly sin. We all are guilty of something. Nicole, what's your vice? Matt, peace of mind. I don't have it. Nicole, is that a sin? Matt, it's not a sin. But it is the leading cause of all deadly sins. Ironically, I had the devil inside my conscious. I hear him talking in the back of my brain clearly as if he had something against me. It's a disease. Nicole, what is he saying? Matt, he is telling me she might be guilty. Nicole, do you believe him? Matt, I don't know if I should believe him. It is illness. But I once planted evidence on a guy that I knew was guilty. He killed his girlfriend. Actually, she was his mistress. The guy has a wife and three daughters. The girl and he had a fallout. She got pregnant in the middle, and threatened to tell his wife. His wife is rich. He didn't want to risk it. So, he rented a car, took the girl to the forest and shot her in the head. There were tire marks. But it wasn't enough evidence. There was no way we could prove he did it in the court of law, all that bullshit reasonable doubt. Even if we you put all the pieces together, the juries wouldn't have believed us. I mean she was investigative reporter, doing a story on CIA. Stating that CIA is helping the Mexico cartels bringing cocaine to the USA. Anybody could have killed her. But I knew she was doing that article to get a kick out of it. CIA didn't give a fuck about it. Nobody really took her seriously. She lacked credibility. The guy killed her to save his marriage. So, I put his DNA at the crime scene, and planted a gun in his house that has his fingerprints, done neatly at my lab. They found him guilty. He's now serving life behind bars. Nicole, does that mean you're a good guy? Matt, I would like to think so. Matt takes out the photo of Ethan and Nicole from the envelope and places it on the counter. Nicole, what's that? Matt, why don't you tell me? Nicole, a handsome man whom I was having sex with. John must have hired a PI and had me photographed. Is it a crime to have affair in this town? Matt, no. It's not. But when you have a dead husband. And you're the sole inheritor of his house and insurance money. It looks suspicious, plus a monster buried in the basement. It makes you look a bad girl. Nicole, what do you have in mind? Matt, 100 million dollars that your husband hide in the basement. There is a silent moment. He then. Matt, I'm in your side. I'm not that greedy. I just need few millions. Nicole, do you know anything about safe combination? Matt, where is it? Hint. Nicole's house, basement, night. Nicole and Matt come to the basement. Nicole leads Matt toward the safe. It's covered with a wooden closet. Nicole, do you mind pushing it aside? Matt pushes it aside, revealing the safe. Nicole, John gave me a fake combination number. Do you know anyone who can open it? Matt, this is new safe combination. Nobody can open it. Nicole, are you sure? Matt, maybe one guy, a man named Cody. But he's serving five years behind bars in San Pedro. I arrested him for attempting murder. Nicole, can you bring him? Nicole seductively approaches him and kisses him. Nicole, we'll split the money 50 50 -ths. She kisses him. They kiss intimately. Nicole then bites Matt's lips. Matt pushes her. Matt, why did you bite me for? Nicole, what's the matter, are you gay? Is that how you kiss a girl? He slaps her across the face. Nicole, I know you're a faggot. You even slap like a girl, why don't you just fuck me and show me how tough you really are, bitch. Matt grabs her hair in a flash and kisses her with strong craving. She kisses him. Matt rips her clothes exposing her breasts. He kisses her breasts. Nicole allows him. Matt then removes all of his cloths and stands in front of her naked. Nicole spits on his face. Matt slaps her with the back of his hand and turns her around, pushes her against a wooden table, rips her underwear and begins to fuck her behind rough. EXT Lou Garage, day. Ethan is fixing the flying car. It's Sunday. Business hour is closed. Nicole comes driving her Chevy Corvette convertible and pulls at the garage. Ethan looks at her. Nicole gets out of her car. Ethan stops what he was doing and approaches her. Ethan, what are you doing here? Nicole, I missed you. She removes her sunglass. There are marks on her eyes. Ethan, what happened? Nicole, a cop named Matt hit me and raped me. He knows about the money. He knows about us. There is a picture of me and you in my car that he gave me. Nicole points at it. We see the photo of Ethan and Nicole in the passenger seat. Ethan sees it. 
He turns his eyes and looks at Nicole. Ethan, I'll kill him. He wasn't supposed to touch you. Nicole, no. Don't kill him yet. They exchange soft kisses. Nicole, he's coming Monday with a man who knows how to open safes. They exchange soft kisses. Nicole, the guy is in prison. They exchange soft kisses. Nicole, after they open it, you'll tell him not to touch me again. They kiss intimately. Int. Lou Garage, Lou's office, day. Ethan and Nicole make love at Lou's office. Ethan is fucking her behind bending her against the desk. It's pure pornography. They both are completely nude. Then when we thought it's straight sex, they face each other and kiss passionately, with a lot of tongues as if they were the greatest lovers in the history of humankind. Ethan then grabs her buttocks, picks her up and enters her repeatedly with amazing speed as Nicole screams in sexual pleasure. Int. San Pedro Prison, Hallway, Day. Matt escorts a man named Cody, whose hands are cuffed, walking down the prison hallway. EXT San Pedro Prison, Parking Lot, Unmarked Police Car, Day. Matt and Cody come to Matt's new unmarked police car. Matt removes the cuff from Cody's hands and asks him to get in the passenger seat. Cody sits in the passenger seat. Matt walks around the car, gets behind the wheel, starts the car. They drive away. Int. Nicole's house, basement, night. Nicole, Matt, and Cody, who is carrying a bag, come to the safe. Cody puts down the bag on the floor and looks at the safe as if he were going to take care of it without a single bit of difficulty. Cody, it's a piece of cake. Cody opens the bag, grabs his gears, and begins to work on the safe. He looks like a magician if not a safe doctor, listening to every tick, turn, movement, using one device after another device, drilling the safe like a brain surgeon. Nicole and Matt watch in wonder. Int. Nicole's house, basement, later. Cody puts the last magical touch on the cabinet and opens the safe, revealing millions of dollars. Matt beams up with a big smile. Cody is just proud of that he opens the safe. Nicole stands without any expression. In the meantime, out of nowhere comes Ethan with a gun and shoots Matt twice in the chest just as he turns. Matt falls and dies at the spot. Yet Ethan can't bring himself into shooting Cody. He just looks at him in confusion. Cody stands with his hands up like don't kill me. I didn't do anything. Then a bullet pierces his throat and comes out the back of his neck. Nicole shoots him. Cody holds his throat, goes down, and kicks his legs violently as his soul separates from his flesh. Ethan can't believe what he's looking at. He is speechless. Cody is finally dead. Ethan quickly collects himself. Nicole walks to the safe and grabs the money. Nicole, baby. We are rich. Ethan comes to the safe and grabs a stake of money. They are marked $5,000 with the picture of a president. Even though it's $100 million. The whole thing can fit in a big tennis bag. Nicole, we can fit everything in a big bag. She puts her arms around him. They kiss. Ethan looks at the body of Cody. He seems a little bit lost. Ethan, let's get rid of these bodies. Nicole, we'll do it later. Let's celebrate first. They kiss intimately. They remove each other clothes. They get nude. Ethan and Nicole kiss more seductively. Matt and Cody's bloods have already covered the floor. Ethan and Nicole go down on the floor and begin to make love on the blood, next to the dead bodies. It looks a little bit sadistic but erotic. Nicole even uses Matt's body as a pillow to rest her head while Ethan entering her. They both are drenched in blood, rolling top of each other. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Nicole's house, bathroom, shower box, night. Ethan and Nicole continue to make love while taking shower. We stay with them for a bit. EXT desert, night. Ethan is digging a grave hole in the middle of nowhere. Matt and Cody's dead bodies lie on the ground, nearby. Nicole stands there looking at Ethan while smoking a cigarette. EXT desert, later. Ethan makes a grave that's enough for two people and climbs out of the grave. He pulls Matt's body and places it in the grave. Ethan then drags Cody's body and places it in the same grave. Ethan covers the bodies with dirt. Nicole continues to watch him while smoking cigarette. We see a couple of cigarette butts near Nicole's feet. Int. Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, moving, Don. It's a 1953 Aston Martin DB2 convertible. Ethan's behind the wheel. Nicole is in the passenger seat. They are driving in the middle of nowhere. EXT Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, moving, Don. An established shot of Ethan's Aston Martin DB2 convertible driving in the middle of nowhere. EXT slash int. Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, moving, day. Ethan continues to drive. Nicole is sleeping on Ethan's chest. She seems lost in a beautiful dream. Ethan kisses her on the temple. Nicole opens her eyes and looks around. She asks Ethan where they are. Ethan tells her something. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. Nicole says something. Ethan tells something. Ethan must have said something that is romantic. Nicole smiles in beauty. She removes her underwear and throws it out of the car. She comes closer and begins to kiss him. Ethan is distracted. The car drives off the lane, wobbling. Ethan gets the car under control, drives a little bit and pulls on the side of the road. Int. Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, day. Nicole sits on top of Ethan. Ethan opens his pants. They kiss and begin to make love in the car. 
EXT Motel, Night. An established shot of a motel. Ethan and Nicole come driving and park their Aston Martin in front of the motel. They get out of the car and walk toward the office. EXT Motel, First Floor, Night. Ethan and Nicole come to their room kissing. Nicole parts her lips. Nicole, should we leave the money in the car? I don't want people to steal it. Ethan, I'll go get it. They kiss. Nicole, I'll go inside and fill the bathtub with hot water and soap. They kiss more intimately. Int. Motel, Ethan and Nicole's room, night. Nicole fills the tub with hot water. EXT Motel, parking lot, Aston Martin convertible, night. Ethan takes a bag out of the trunk that has $100 million, carries it on his shoulder, closes the trunk, and goes to the room. Int. Motel, Nicole and Ethan's room, bathroom, night. Nicole stands in front of the mirror, applying makeup on her face. She is wearing a sexy light purple translucent night dress that shows her skin. She is not wearing neither a bra nor underwear. She looks sensual. Main room. Ethan opens the door from outside and enters, carrying the bag. He puts down the bag on the floor and walks toward the bathroom. Bathroom. Nicole continues to apply makeup on her face. Ethan comes behind her and looks at her through the mirror. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, do you think I'm beautiful? Ethan, the most beautiful girl I have ever seen in my life. He plants a soft kiss on her neck. Nicole, I meant inside. Ethan, without missing a beat. I'm in love with the girl that resides in your soul, and she is responsible for making your eyes sparkle brighter than the stars, your lips taste sweeter than honey, and your face glow more radiant than the angels and saints in heaven. Above all, she knows what she wants. Ethan plants a soft kiss on her neck. Nicole applies a red lipstick on her lips. She then wipes the lipstick off her lips with the back of her hand, turns around, and faces him. Nicole, do you really love me? Ethan, I'm addicted to you. They kiss more passionately. Ethan caresses her neck. He slowly opens her night dress, revealing her beautiful body. He kisses her breast sensually, goes down and kisses her vagina. She holds his head closer to her vulva in sensuality. Ethan pulls a pubic hair from Nicole's vulva with his teeth, slowly gets up and kisses her lips. He then picks her up and takes her to the bedroom. Bedroom. Ethan comes to the bedroom carrying Nicole, places her on the bed. They kiss more passionately. Ethan then caresses her neck, kisses her breast, plants a soft kiss on her belly, comes between her legs and begins to give her oral pleasure. Close, up, Nicole. She sighs in sexual pleasure. Int. Motel, Nicole and Ethan's room, bedroom, night. Ethan and Nicole make love on the money. In the meantime, we see money raining from the skies and falling on Ethan and Nicole. It's a special effect, to give the scene an artistic take. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Motel, Nicole and Ethan's room, bathroom, night. Ethan and Nicole sit in bathtub. Nicole is behind in romance. Ethan rests on Nicole's chest in relaxation. They are talking between soft kisses. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. We see glasses of wines near the bathtub. Ethan must have say something humorously. Nicole smiles in beauty. She hits him on the arm twice. Ethan tries to defend himself. Then Ethan and Nicole kiss passionately. Int. Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, moving, day. Ethan is behind the wheel. Nicole is in the passenger seat. They are driving in the middle of nowhere. EXT Ethan's Aston Martin convertible, moving, day. An established shot of Ethan's Aston Martin driving in middle of nowhere. It seems they are heading to Mexico. The air looks dry. EXT Restaurant, Day. An established shot of a beautiful restaurant in the middle of nowhere. Ethan and Nicole come driving their Aston Martin and park the car at the parking lot. Ethan and Nicole get out of the car. Ethan comes to the trunk, takes out the bag, and carries it. Nicole insists on helping him, humorously. But Ethan tells her he got it. They exchange juicy kisses as they walk toward the restaurant. Int. Restaurant, Day. The restaurant is almost empty. There are two or three people enjoying late lunch. Ethan and Nicole walk in. There is no head waitress that sit customers like most restaurants. Customers come and take seats by themselves. Ethan and Nicole come at the far end of the restaurant. Ethan puts the bag on the floor and sits at a table. Nicole sits in front of him. A waitress comes to their table to take order. We don't hear what they are saying due to the music on the soundtrack. The waitress takes their order and walks away. Ethan and Nicole continue to talk without a sound. Nicole then excuses Ethan and goes to the bathroom. The camera stays with Ethan. The waitress comes with Ethan's coke, places it at his table, and walks away. Ethan takes a sip. Then at the door three Mexican, Carlos, Rodriguez, and Raul, walks in. Ethan looks at them. They walk toward him. Ethan looks at the gun in his belt and thinks if they fuck with him, he will kill them, simple like that. Carlos is the leader. Carlos, what's up, amigo? Ethan says nothing. Carlos reverses Nicole's chair and sits in front of Ethan. Rodriguez and Raul stand nearby, holding their guns. Carlos, do you mind if I have your drink? Carlos grabs Ethan's soda, drinks everything, and puts the glass on the table. Carlos, I was thirsty like the devil. What you got in that bag? Ethan, it's my dirty clothes, 
football jerseys. I play a lot of soccer. Carlos, that's what I thought too. Ethan takes his gun in a flash and points the gun at Carlos. Rodriguez and Raul point their guns at Ethan. They are having Mexico stand off. Ethan, I'll give you guys three seconds to drop your guns on the floor. Or I'll put a bullet hole between his eyes. Carlos gives them a sign. Rodriguez and Raul hold their guns down. Ethan, drop them on the floor. Carlos smiles at Ethan. Carlos, they are not going to drop them. Do you know why? There is no bullet in your gun. Go ahead, shoot me. Ethan thinks twice. Carlos, I could be wrong. But if you pull that trigger and there is nothing. I'll kill you personally for attempting murder. Ethan thinks more. Carlos, what are you waiting for, are you scared? Ethan points the gun at Carlos's shoulder and pulls the trigger. Like Carlos said, there is no bullet in the gun. Nothing comes out of it. Carlos, I told you. Rodriguez and Raul point their guns at Ethan. If Ethan makes another wrong move, they will blow him away. Carlos, your girlfriend played you big time. The bag is filled with underwear and newspaper. She took the money. There is only three million dollar in that bag. It's our payment. She hired us to kill you. Ethan says nothing, can't believe what Carlos is telling him. He just puts his gun aside. Carlos gives Rodriguez a sign to get the bag as Raul points the gun at Ethan. Rodriguez grabs the bag, breaks the key with his gun, and opens the bag. It's filled with Nicole clothes, underwear, bras, newspapers. Then Rodriguez finds $3 million in a plastic bag and gives the money to Carlos. Carlos, it's our payment. Carlos puts the money in his chest pocket, takes out his gun, and points it at Ethan. Carlos, here is how I do things. I'm going to make you dig your own grave. It'll give you time to pray. Maybe some divine intervention could prevent your demise like earthquake, solar eclipse. A Scorpio might show up. I'm Scorpion. I'm willing to bend few rules, which is if you cooperate with us. Or I'll just shoot you in the head and splatter your brain all over the place. Rodriguez and Raul will clean the place and throw your body in the dumpster. The choice is yours. Ethan says nothing. Int. Carlos's fa GMC, moving, day. It's a 2000 GMC four wheel. Ethan sits in the back. His hands are tied with a rob. Rodriguez sits next to him, pointing his gun at Ethan. Carlos sits in the passenger seat. He is pointing his gun at Ethan as well. Raul is behind the wheel driving. Ethan, guys wait, before you do anything that you'll regret. You might consider this. I'll triple the money she paid you, $12 million. Carlos, $12 million sounds tempting. Ethan, make it $24 million. No that is nothing. I'll find her myself and give you $35 million. Just let me go. Carlos, $35 million is a lot of money. What are we going to do with it? Ethan, do whatever you want to do with it. That girl run away with $100 million. She is in Mexico. I will track her down and split the money with you 50 50 -ths. Carlos, from $12 million to 50. That's brilliant. But you see. I'm not greedy. Can you imagine after I took $3 million and didn't do the job, what do you think will happen to my reputation? It'll be ruined forever. Ethan, fuck your reputation. What the fuck do you need reputation for? You're an assassin. If I were you, I would retire after $50 million and start thinking about how I am going to spend the money. Carlos, first, I do this for fun. There is a line that I don't cross. I don't double cross my clients. If I do, nobody will do business with me. Ethan, why would you want to kill again if you have $65 million in your bank account? Carlos, now, it's $65 million. I like this guy style. He knows how to do business. I don't blame him. We are talking about his life. It's worth something. But he doesn't know who's dealing with. To Ethan, do you know what they call me here? Ethan says nothing. Carlos, tell him Rodriguez. Rodriguez, el hombre que tiene diablo. Carlos, it translates into English, the man that the devil fears. It's because I don't work either for God or for the devil. I do things that please me. I will kill you on general principle, which I'm paid to do so. I will then track your girlfriend down, kill her and keep all 100 million dollars. Ethan then looks at his right. There is a cliff. In the last effort to save his life, he elbows Rodriguez in the nose, quickly grabs the gun from Carlos's hand. There is a straggle, pure chaos. Rodriguez is holding his nose in pain. Ethan and Carlos are fighting to get control of the gun. Carlos takes a couple of wild shot. A bullet hits Raul in the head. Raul steps on the gas and drives off the cliff. The car crashes. It seems they all are dead. Maybe unconscious. There is no movement. We see Carlos's neck through the front window smashed. He is dead. Raul is dead too. His brain doesn't look too good. It opens into two halves covered with blood. Rodriguez is not breathing. On the other hand, Ethan seems alright, compared to the rest of them. He is just unconscious. Yet he looks dead. There is blood on his head. After few seconds, Ethan regains consciousness. Ethan removes the robs from his hands, squeezes out of the car, and gets on his feet. Ethan goes back to the car and takes the money from Carlos' pocket. 
he looks at Carlos's gun nearby, grabs it, and walks away from the accident. EXT Mexico Road, Day. Ethan stands in the middle of nowhere waiting for Rod. A young man comes driving a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner convertible and stops next to Ethan. Ethan points his gun at the man and tells him to get out of the car. The dude obeys in trepidation, opens the door, gets out of the automobile, and puts his hands up, as if he were telling me don't shoot me, just take the car. Ethan gets behind the wheel and drives away. Int. Plymouth convertible, moving, day. Ethan doesn't look too good. He seems in a lot of pain drenched in fever. He's bleeding from his head. But somehow, he continues to manage to drive. EXT Plymouth convertible, moving, day. An establishing shot of Plymouth Roadrunner convertible driving in the road of Mexico. EXT Ranch, day. An established shot of a ranch. We see horses, chicken, pigs, a dog, etc. It's a big farm. We see young woman about 23 Marta and her boyfriend Kevin, 25, stand talking while watching the horses going in circle. Then Ethan comes driving the 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner convertible, goes off the street, and crashes into horse's house. Int. Ranch, horse's house, day. We see more horses. Ethan lies unconscious in the car. Marta and Kevin come to the horse's house and slowly approach Ethan. Marta looks at him with tenderness. She likes him. EXT Beach, day. Ethan, wearing white shirt and pants, stands in the beach looking at the ocean. He is holding a red rose. Nicole, wearing a white wedding gown, approaches him. She has wings like an angel from heaven. Nicole, didn't I tell you I'd break your heart? She kisses him on the lips. They kiss more intimately. Ethan's hand, which has the rose, begins to bleed. Bloods drop on the sand like tears. Each blood drop turns into a dragonfly and fly around Ethan and Nicole. Then the sky is covered with cloud. Nicole's white wedding gown turns into dark violet dress. She scatters into blackbirds, and the blackbirds fly away, leaving Ethan alone. It begins to rain. Lightning cuts through the skies. The ocean waves crash against the sand violently. Then a dragon comes out of the thin air and approaches Ethan, breathing fire. Ethan stands back. He thinks about running but the dragon will get him anyway. The dragon comes near him and breathes fire at him. It seems Ethan is not affected by the fire. Instead, Ethan slowly begins to transform into a dragon himself. He is in a lot of pain from the transformation like John Landis's American Werewolf in London. The main dragon flies toward the ocean. It goes up in the air, comes down and crashes on the ocean. It scatters into millions fire. The ocean sets on fire. Ethan completely transformed into dragon. In the meantime, the background changes into hellish-like places. Ethan is a dragon. He enters another dimension, hell, mysteriously. Hell, night. We see all kinds of nude people having orgy. People participating in all kinds of SNM erotic sex. All that's taboo is in display, etc. It's nothing like the hell that is mentioned on Bible, but all kinds of beautiful people participating in explicit sex. We see Nicole having SNM erotic sex with 10 muscular guys. Dragon Ethan approaches her. The guys stand aside in respect. Nicole spreads her legs seductively and tells Dragon Ethan to come closer with her index finger in allurement. Dragon Ethan comes between her legs and begins to fuck her. Nicole then transforms to a dragon as well. Dragon Ethan continues to enter her. Dragon Nicole then turns into regular Nicole, so does Ethan, he turns into a regular human being. Ethan and Nicole continue to make love in the middle of sexual extravaganza. We see people having sex everywhere. Ethan is on fire as he continues to enter Nicole. Then all of a sudden, the fire turns into snow. Ethan and Nicole enter a different dimension. Snowflakes falls from the skies. Ethan and Nicole continue to make love in the snow while snowflakes falling on them. Ethan then comes inside Nicole as she reaches climax. Int. Ranch, guest room, bedroom, night. Ethan wakes up drenched with fever. It's a nightmare. He notices he is not wearing any cloth. Ethan just goes back to sleep. Marta walks in, stands and looks at him with fondness. She is in love with him. She gets closer and give him a soft kiss on the lips. Marta then lies next to him, leaning on her hand while gazing at his eyes. She gets closer and gives him another soft kiss on the lips. She adds another kiss. She then removes the blanket and looks at his private part. She slowly begins to message it. Marta gets up, removes her clothes, sits on Ethan's groin, and begins to ride him cowgirl style. Ethan's dream. Marta turns into Nicole mysteriously. Nicole rides him. She is on fire. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Ranch, guest room, day. Ethan remains asleep. His arm is attached with a medical glucose. He then opens his eyes, removes the glucose from his hand, and slowly gets up. Ethan is wearing a pajama. Marta walks in. Marta, hey. Ethan, hi. Marta, the doctor said you should rest. You had a concussion. Ethan, what's the date, when did I get here? Marta, you have been unconscious for five days. Flashback, Ethan remembers Marta shaving his beard, kissing his lips and changing his cloths, etc. Ethan, did you change my cloth? Marta, yes, I did. She takes out the money from her breast seductively. Marta, I found this money from your pocket, but didn't count it, 
just kept it with me. I didn't want anyone to take it. Something tells me you might need it when you wake up. She gives him the money. Ethan, thanks. Marta, do you mind if I ask you a question? Where did you get the money? I mean, does the money have anything to do with you being in this situation? Ethan, sort of. Marta, what is sort of? Ethan, it's a long story. I don't have time to explain it. I must go. Where are my clothes? Marta, it's in the horse's house. Follow me. Marta walks toward the exit. Ethan follows her. Int. Ranch, horse's house, day. We see the same horses that we saw earlier. The ground is covered with dry grasses. There are stacks of parched grasses. Ethan and Nicole enter in ease. Ethan, where's it? Marta, I burnt them. Ethan, why did you burn them? Marta gets closer and kisses him. She removes her clothes and stands nude in front of him. Marta, I thought you might not need them anymore. They were dirty. They had blood on them. Marta opens the buttons of Ethan's pajama and caresses his chest. Ethan can't resist the idea of making love to this beautiful creature in this place. She looks like Kate Upton. They kiss intimately. Ethan and Marta get down on the parched grasses and continue to kiss intimately. Ethan then removes his pant, completely nude, comes between her legs, and enters her. Marta begins to sigh with sexual pleasure. We stay with them for a bit. Int. Ranch, horse's house, day. Ethan and Marta lie on the grass. They are nude like how God made Adam and Eve at the Genesis. Marta rests on Ethan's chest. Ethan is smoking cigarette. Marta, you're leaving me. Ethan, I must find this girl. Her life is in danger. Marta, will you come back? Ethan, I can't promise you anything. But I will come and see you someday if things work out how I pictured it in my brain. She begins to touch his private part as he continues to smoke. Marta, why are you leaving me, you don't like me? Ethan, I like you. You're beautiful, kind, and sexy. He kisses her on the temple. Ethan, but I have unfinished business. I must take care of it, or things could get out of hand. She continues to give him hand job. Marta, don't go. I'm in love with you. She kisses him on the cheek. Marta, referring to his private part it's hard. Marta gets on the top of him and begins to ride him lasciviously, making all kinds of sexual sounds. Ethan kills the cigarette, gets her on the bottom, and enters her sweetly. He then lifts her right leg, places it on his shoulder, and increases the speed. We stay with them for a bit. Modage, Venice, Italy. A quick take of Venice, the Piazza San Marco, the Grand Canal. La Venice, a view of the city, the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, etc. Nicole sits in a gondola. A gondolier gives her a tour at the Grand Canal. She seems lost in thought. Nicole visits St. Mark's Basilica. Nicole takes a walk at Piazza San Marco. The Carnival of Venice. Nicole looks at the carnival. All of a sudden, she feels a sense of being watched. She looks at all directions. All kinds of stranger people are looking at her. Some gives her a nice smile. Some look at her weird. Young men look at her with desire. That gives her confidence. It makes her forget all her trouble. Nicole sits in the pub at a fancy restaurant and has dinner, shrimp pasta and a glass of red wine. She is not really eating. She's lost in thought, takes a couple of sips from her drink. Resort and hotel, Nicole's room. Nicole stands in the porch and looks at the Grand Canal and the breathtaking view of Venice in the night, holding a glass of scotch and smoking a cigarette. She has a sip, takes a drag from her cigarette and breathes out the smoke as she continues to watch the city of Venice in the night. Resort and hotel, Nicole's room bathtub. Nicole sits in the bathtub surrounded by candlelight and continues to drink and smoke. It seems she missed Ethan. Her eyes are filled with tears. They glow more resplendent than the stars in the sky. EXT Venice Lido, Beach, Day. Nicole lies on her back sun tanning. She is wearing a sunglass and a beautiful swimsuit, which barely covers anything. She looks sexy as usual. Then out of nowhere comes Ethan, and sits next to her pretending to be tying his shoe. He is holding a red rose. Ethan, hi. Nicole removes her sunglass. She is not surprised to see him. She gets up and sits on the blanket that she was lying on. Nicole, what's up? Ethan, nothing much. Ethan gives her his hand. She takes his hand. They both stand on their feet. Nicole, I thought you were dead. Ethan, I'm like a cat. I have nine lives. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, how did you find me? Ethan, it's not that hard to track down someone as beautiful as you. I hired a private detective and told him to find the most beautiful girl in the world. Nicole, do you still think I'm beautiful? Ethan, the fairest them of all. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, so, what are you going to do? Ethan, I don't know, a beat, I still love you more than life itself. But I can't trust you. You almost had me killed. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, are you after the money? Ethan, no, I'm not. What am I going to do with 100 million dollars? To be honest, it has never been about the money. I have always loved you more than the beats of my heart. I wouldn't trade you for all the stars in heaven. There is a silent moment. She then. Nicole, what do you want from me? 
Ethan, closure. Nicole, what closure? Ethan, do you still have the money with you? Nicole, no. Frank took it. Ethan, that's what I thought too. But don't worry. I got the money. I just asked you to see what you were going to say. Nicole, you don't trust me. Ethan, not with my life. You are looking at a dead man walking. We see a young man standing with a bag. Ethan gives the young man a sign. The young man comes to Ethan, places the money next to him and walks away. Ethan opens the bag and shows her the money. Ethan, I took the money from Frank. He's dead. The private detective that I hired tracked him down and told me his whereabouts. Montage, Santorini. Quick shot of Santorini, Greece. Pira, main town of Santorini, OIA, Panagia Episcopi, Pergios Callistus Village, Theotokos Church, etc. EXT Santorini Hotel and Resort, Day. An established shot of Santorini Hotel and Resort. It's a 100-story hotel built next to the Mediterranean Sea. Int. Santorini Hotel and Resort, Lobby, Day. Flashback. Frank, 36, who is carrying a bag that has $100 million, walks down the lobby. A bellboy approaches him and tells him that he will carry the bag for him. However, Frank tells him it's alright, just to get lost, and continues to walk toward the elevator. If we are not mistaken, he looks like Richard, the same guy, who gave the photos of Ethan and Nicole to Detective Matt. He was wearing fake plastic face to make him look older. Frank gets in the elevator and presses a button. The elevator doors close. Int. Santorini Hotel and Resort, Frank Room, Day. Flashback. Frank opens the bag and empties the money on the bed. He goes to the bar, grabs a bottle of whiskey, and drinks the liquor from the bottle. Frank puts a Chesterfield on his mouth, pulls $5,000 from a stack of bucks, sets the money on fire, with a lighter, and lights his cigarette. He has a puff from the cigarette, breathes out the smoke, and takes out the fire off the money. Frank walks to the porch while smoking. EXT Santorini Hotel and Resort, Frank Room, Porch, Flashback. Frank comes to the frame and looks at the breathtaking view of the island and Mediterranean Sea from 100th floor while smoking and taking sips. Int. Santorini Hotel and Resort, Frank Room, Morning, Flashback. Ethan sits in a chair, holding a gun. Ethan has brought two goons Wesley and Woody, who are standing at his right side and left side. Frank is sleeping. He then opens his eyes and sees them. He slowly gets up and sits on the far end of the bed, his back resting on the bed frame. Ethan, what's up? My name is Ethan. I believe you know who I am and why I came here. I'll save you the trouble. You have something that belonged to me. Why don't you tell these gentlemen where you put it? Frank, I don't know what you're talking about. Ethan gives them a sign. Woody and Wesley walk up to Frank. Wesley grabs him by the hair. EXT Santorini Hotel and Resort, Porch, Morning. Flashback. Frank is upside down, screaming. Woody and Wesley hold each of his legs. Frank, crying, screaming, and shouting I'll tell you. It's in the closet. Pull me up. Please pull me up, I don't want to die. Ethan gives them a sign to pull him up. They pull him up. Int. Santorini Hotel and Resort, Frank Room, Morning. Flashback. Frank pulls out the bag from a closet and puts the bag in front of Ethan. Ethan gives Wesley to check it out. Wesley opens the bag, takes out a stack, and shows Ethan the money. Ethan is satisfied. He gives Woody a sign. Woody shoots Frank between his eyes. Frank falls dead. EXT Venice, Beach, Day. Present. Back to, Ethan and Nicole. Ethan, you made a killer out of me. I became a gangster. Ethan gives her the red rose. Nicole, are you here to kill me as well? Ethan, no I love you more than it hurts. But you see those two guys in black suits. They work for me. They're assassins. We see Woody and Wesley standing nearby. Nicole looks at them without a single grain of fear. Nicole, I'm not going to apologize. Don't take it personal. It was only business. Like Barbara Stanwyck said, we're both rotten. Ethan, you are rottener than I am. You're going to burn in the lowest level of hell for eternity. I might be there just a level above you and watch you get roasted like a demon every single minute of it. Nicole, it's like that. Ethan, what can I tell you? Nicole, you break my heart. But as long as you're there watching me burn at the lowest level of hell, I'll take a comfort that I have always loved you. My tears will cool down hell like spring morning. Roses will grow everywhere. That is enough for me. There is a silent moment. They stand lips to lips as if they want to kiss from here to eternity and beyond. He then. Ethan, come on baby. Let's not get carried away. You know I'm incapable of inflicting the slightest wound on you. I'm the one who is going to burn at the lowest level of hell if anything happens to you, even a scratch. Let's just forget about it and start new. I think it's romantic to spend the rest of your life with someone who tried to have you killed. We're like a couple. Couples fight over stupid things, make up, break up, get back, and go to church on Sunday. However, we're not like any couple that breathes oxygen. Instead, we breathe fire. We're passionate. We kill for each other. We die for each other. We breathe for each other. We worship each other. When we fight, we kill each other. 
when we love, we give everything we have from the bottom of our hearts. When we kiss, we clash our souls till knives grow in our essences and cut our hearts. We wouldn't part our lips till we bleed to death. Our very existence is mystery. No one understands how we breathe, love, live, die, and resurrect from death. When we make love, we won't stop till we have out-of-body experience and reach enlightenment. That's true love, baby. Nicole, you'll never forgive me. Ethan, I've already forgiven you the second I found out I was going to die. I was just praying to God that he spared my life, so I could see your beautiful eyes again. That is heaven to me. Nicole, you won't forget it. Ethan, forgetting is the easiest part. I just have to kiss your lips as if my soul depended on it. You are my eternal salvation. He kisses her lips as if his soul depended on it. Nicole drops the rose, puts her arms around him. They kiss more passionately. EXT Ethan's boat, moving, sunset. An established shot of Ethan's multimillion dollar boat cursing in the Mediterranean Sea. Int. Ethan's boat, moving, bedroom, sunset. Ethan and Nicole make love. It's passionate, steamy, and seductive. We stay with them with series cuts. EXT Ethan's boat, bathtub, night. Ethan and Nicole are in the bathtub placed on the deck. It's surrounded by candles. Ethan is behind. Nicole rests on Ethan's chest. We see sparkling stars on the skies. Ethan, if they catch us with the money, we'll go to prison for a while. Nicole, prison can't keep beautiful creatures like us apart. Only our conscience would judge us. Even they catch us, we'd probably escape from prisons, and end up being together for the rest of our lives. Ethan, people like me collect bars, build prisons around their own hearts, fall in love with a beautiful girl like you, and serve life in their own souls with the object of their affection till love do them apart, except in my case, it's a death sentence. Nicole, you said you forgot about it. You lied to me. Cassilis, I did forget about it. I just thought it sounded romantic. Nicole, anyway, who were those guys, the assassins? Ethan, there are nobody. I just paid them thousands of euros to pretend to be my bodyguards. Nicole, did you talk to your way out, those guys in Mexico? Ethan, no I had to kill them, actually, elbowed one of the guy on the face and tried to take the gun away from the main guy. During the straggle, he shot the driver in the head. The car flipped over the cliff. They all died. I managed to walk away with minor concussion. Nicole, what about, you didn't really kill Frank, did you? Ethan, why did you ask? You don't believe me I killed him. She shakes her head no I don't believe you. Ethan, no I didn't kill him, just walked to his room with a gun. Int. Santorini Hotel, Hallway and Frank Room, Day. Flashback. Ethan, dressing as the hotel manager, comes to Frank's room, opens the door with a card, and enters. Int. Santorini Hotel, Frank's Room, Day. Flashback. Ethan takes out his gun and progresses toward the main room. Frank, who is wearing a shower gown, has just finished taking shower a few seconds ago, comes to the main room while drying his hair with a towel. Ethan points his gun at him. Frank drops the small towel and puts his hands up surrendering. Ethan, where is the money? Frank says nothing. Ethan turns his eyes and see the bag on the bed. Ethan, I'm 100% sure that is the money. Frank remains silent. Ethan walks up to the bed and opens the bag while pointing the gun at Frank. It's the money. Ethan, I will take it in a minute, but don't want you to follow me. It's 100 million dollars. I am not going to take a chance. However, you seem a decent guy. I don't want to kill you, unless you do something stupid. Here, I will give you a choice. Ethan takes out a cuff. Ethan, go to the porch and do yourself a favor. Cuff your hands against the frame. If you refuse to do it, I'll shoot you in the kneecaps. I'm told it's extremely painful. You might never walk again. Trust me. It's not worth even a billion euros. Frank takes the cuff and goes to the porch. Ethan keeps a fair distance and follows him behind. Int. Frank room, porch, day. Flashback. Frank cuffs himself against the frame as Ethan stands pointing his gun at him. Ethan, I'll leave you with five million dollars. If you come after me, I'll be ready. Ethan turns around and goes to the main room. Int. Santorini Hotel, Frank's room, day. Flashback. Ethan takes out $5 million from the bag, drops the money on the bed, grabs the bag, and exits the room. Int. Santorini Hotel, Hallway, Day. Flashback. Ethan walks toward the direction of the camera, carrying the bag. Int. Ethan's boat, moving, bedroom, night. Present. Back to, Ethan and Nicole. Nicole, what if he comes after us? You should have killed him. Ethan smiles charismatically as if he were saying, I can't believe this girl. She will kill me one day. Ethan. We just can't go out and kill people. Nicole, why not? Ethan, because they'll haunt us. There will be consequence. You know, you don't want their ghosts to follow you the rest of your life. Nicole, you don't really believe in ghosts, do you? Ethan, I watched ghosts starring Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze as a kid. I started believing that ghosts have unfinished business thing. You know, I couldn't stop thinking about those black sharking things that drag you to hell. It's a bad special effect. 
Maybe I won't be afraid of them if I see it now. Nicole, it's fiction. Don't believe everything you watched. No ghost will haunt us. Ethan, regardless, it taught me a valuable lesson, thou shall not kill. I only kill for you. They kiss French. Nicole, what about the money, did you recover all of them? Ethan, yeah. But I bought a new F-15K Slam Eagle engine, Pratt and Whitney F-100, and spare parts for a total of $70 million and put it in my flying car that I named after you, Nicole. It flies in the air like a spaceship. I will show it you. It's in Australia. Nicole, that means you still have about $25 million. Ethan, I saved that to buy you present. I thought my love might not enough. Nicole, your love is more than enough. I just asked you to toy with your emotions. Ethan, I know, baby. But there is nothing I wouldn't do for you. They kiss French. He parts his lips. Ethan, anyway, I just want to kiss your lips for one last time before I kill you. Out of nowhere, Ethan takes out a gun. Ethan, step out of the bath, baby. Nicole step out of the bath nude and stands in front of him. Ethan, imitating Fred McMurray in Double Indemnity Goodbye, baby. He pulls the trigger. It's a fake gun. Water hits Nicole's on the vagina. Nicole, not too pissed but felt played you're a son of bitch. She enters back in the bath and begins to hit him playfully. Ethan defends himself, blocking some of the smacks. She is on top of him, hitting him. He holds her. Ethan and Nicole then kiss intimately. Nicole parts her lips. Nicole, softly by his lips I love you. Ethan. No love can describe how much I love you. I am nothing without you. They kiss passionately. On the soundtrack, music plays melodiously. EXT Australia, Queensland, Flying Car, Nicole, Day. We are somewhere in Queensland, Australia. It's desert. Ethan and Nicole are about to retest the flying car. But at the moment, Ethan who is sitting on the edge of the hood, and Nicole, who is wearing mini skirt, and standing next to Ethan's heartbeat, are kissing French. On the soundtrack, music continues to play. Close up, Ethan and Nicole. They kiss more intimately and part their lips. Ethan takes her hand. They come to the passenger door. He opens the door for Nicole. She gets in the car. Ethan closes the door, walks around the flying car, opens the door, and gets behind the wheel. Int. Flying car, day. It looks like a plane cockpit. Ethan tells Nicole to put on her seatbelt. She buckles up, so does Ethan. He then turns on a couple of switches, and starts the car. They drive down the desert. EXT slash int. Flying car. Ethan changes the gear. The car gets up in the air and fly just above the ground. Nicole is a little bit terrified, but excited. It is the first flying car. Anything could go wrong. But she pushes the thought aside and enjoys the ride. Ethan flips a switch, gets the car higher and increases the speed. It is capable of flying 1875 miles per hour, in a blink of an eye. Nicole is loving it. She unbuckles her seat belt, comes to Ethan, and kisses his lips. Ethan is a little bit distracted, but quickly collects his thoughts, makes sure everything is under control, unbuckles his seat belt, and places her on his lap. They kiss while flying the car. The flying car wobble in the air. Yet, Ethan gets it in the right direction as he continues to kiss Nicole. EXT flying car, moving, day. A medium shot of the car flying in the air. Int. Flying car, moving, day. Close, up, Ethan and Nicole. They kiss more intimately. The end.